Connecting in, excellent. Uh, welcome everyone to Talking Landscape Photography number 28. Sorry about last week, we uh, we had to put that one off to this week, but uh, we're here now and thanks to everyone for um, joining us. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, we're not with uh, Luke tonight, uh, he's, um, he's away rafting on the Franklin doing some filming for a, an upcoming film. Uh, I think he's due back today or tomorrow though, so it, uh, he won't be long until he's back, but he's been away for a good, what, 10 days or something like that? Yeah, I think he's had a, so Luke's actually um, doing the drone cinematography for um, an amazing film called, um, I think it's called, what's well, about the Franklin campaign. Yeah. It's got a bit of a twist on it in that it actually is through the eyes of, of the daughter slash son of one of the original campaigners who's recently died. And it's kind of like the story of that person reliving you know, and re-engaging with who their father was, you know, posthumously, as well as their own views around con conservation and, and in the context of, of the Franklin. And so yeah. I almost got the job being the still shooter, but not quite. So that means I can be here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, good work. Good work. And it's going to be an amazing film. And uh, But uh, tonight we've got um, Scott McCook all the way from uh, uh, Western Australia. How are you, mate? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Thank you. I, um, well, it's only early for me. It's uh, only 4.30 here. Oh, so. uh, yeah. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Well, very good. And so what we're talking about tonight uh, basically is um, aerial stuff. Um, both um, <clears throat> Paul and Scott um, have got a lot to talk about. Uh, with the aerials, um, in particularly in the Kimberley region. And uh, Scott uh, mentioned just before we came on air, he'd like to talk about some of the things, uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of using different systems, uh, medium format and uh, full frame, and and also now uh, the drones have improved uh, just using exclusively drones. Uh, but uh, welcome, Scott, and uh, this is going to be an interesting episode. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it, mate. Um... Well, I'll, I'll I'll give Scotty a bit of a bit of a plug. So, so one of the one of the things I was looking forward to tonight, Scott and I are really good friends, and my journey as an aerial photographer and Scott's have been very very intertwined over a long period of time now. And I have to thank Scott for, for going way back, and we're going to share some of the stories. And we've learned a lot about the craft through each other, and we've gone on a lot of actual physical adventures together to all sorts of places, mainly in West Australia. So, so we thought we were going to sort of mix it up with some of our hectic, crazy stories and some of the learnings along the way and maybe a few shots of Millie in the bag background. Yeah, Millie's somewhere. Oh, yeah. she's on the couch. Really. Which is Scott's very famous Labrador, who's a hell of a character and I love to bit. And uh, I have slept on their couch in the background, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> uh, on numerous occasions. Yeah. And, <laughs> You so, slipped on plenty of couches, Paul. <laughs> and uh, Scott is is renowned not only nationally but probably internationally as as being one of the most progressive and innovative and creative um, photographers, particularly in an aerial perspective. Like Scott's not pigeonholed into aerial work, uh, like myself. But for both of us, it's become, and it is kind of a lot of what we're known for, and a lot of where we sort of apply ourselves um, yeah. and get some of our most juice from, I guess, and. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed. I haven't got Scotty's list of bloody accolades in front of me, but he's got bloody plenty. And he's he's been uh, bridesmaid to uh, Landscape Photography of the Year, I think, twice <laughs> now. Yeah, yeah. Even though, even though he had the highest scoring folio, so go figure. Um, yeah. nice. So he's right up there with the best of the best, essentially. Um, now, Scotty, what was the last year when you won the IPA, was it? Yeah, I've yeah, about four or five years ago now. Um, and oh, really? Yes, there's Millie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's bored already. Come on, Millie. We just started. She'll get out of here. Um, yeah, I mean IPA. Um, and yeah, a lot of bridesmaids for the for the appers so far. But um, but I'm still trying. I'll get there. And WA. Yeah, WA. Yeah, same. Um, but yeah, I mean, I oh, God, I can't really remember. I I um. I haven't entered anything in a you know prop in the last couple of years. I just entered the Australian Photography Awards this year, and I've just been short. Three of my images have been shortlisted, which I'm really stoked about. Um, but we'll see. I know you've got a couple as well, Paulie. Oh, you, you tip me, mate. You got three. You're you're leading the charge. <laughs> Tom told me, hey, Tom. I spoke to Tom. He said he got nine in. I said, yeah, right. So, but no, he didn't. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. So, so if you hear Tom, we're talking about the 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 one and only Mr. Tom Putt. Yeah, yeah. 
So uh, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we met, Scotty, which to me sets a scene a little bit about how we started and who the kind of character that you are and why we met. So I was, uh, I was invited to judge the West Australian Professional Photography Awards and I asked the boys from a likelihood the group, oh, you know, I'm going over to WA, who do you know over there? Like, who should I connect with? And because um, when I go over to judge, I kind of use that as an opportunity to go on a trip. <laughs> <laughs> And like, you know, they're, they're paying the flight. So I'm like, well, I don't need to come back the day after the trip because that's how I live my life and not many people do. So I'm like, I want to go on some adventures. And they said, oh, and I think it was Luke in particular, Luke, um, Luke Austin. So oh, there's this really cool dude, Scotty, you should, oh, you guys are getting on real well. You should hook up with him. And so I just reached out totally blindly, never even heard of the guy before. And uh, just introduced myself, said I'm coming over and I'd love to get up to something. And I think within 24 hours, <laughs> total stranger he'd organized these not one but two incredible like three or four multi-day trips to you know 10 12 hours drive to like shark bay and kalgoorlie with flights and everything and i was just like oh my god this guy doesn't even know me i was like what a champion and um and so we we got away with the first one and we'll go through with that but it's a testament to 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 scotty's character and his incredible generosity when we did the kalgoorlie one we had a real issue in that the planes didn't arrive and I was stuck uh, behind a storm somewhere and they couldn't get back to the landing strip we were at. And, and we we're all like, Oh, it's all over. Oh, it's, we're screwed. And, and I was, you know, me being who I am, I'm like, I didn't bloody come all the way over here to give up now, mate. And I was in there hammering away and I was trying to come up. You were, with you were in there for about four hours, Paul, I reckon. Like <laughs> you did not give up. You, you tell that part, Scotty. Yeah. yeah well, Paul, I, one thing I learned from Paul over the years is he does not give up. So, me and Austin sort of did half an hour of begging and went, right, oh, it's not going to happen. You know, we'll go, we'll go back to the camp and have a beer. And Paul's like, nah. And he just stayed in the, uh, in the airport hangar there and just explored every option. Four hours later, walked out and said, we got one plane and we're leaving in, I think it was, uh, I think it was the next morning, wasn't it? I think they, they. Yeah, they- I think so. And then we, we slept that night in a, in a spider ridden kind of shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. without yeah. even a roof just about on the next to the lake and it's where they, it's where they do all the um the wind sailing on the salt pans yeah, out. The bottom of lake the Freud, wasn't it yeah yeah so we yeah shacked up there but yeah they only had one plane in the morning so we had a logistical issue with numbers and so I, think one- we, I think we lost a day and we lost the plane so basically and i had to get back six and a half or eight hours drive but it was back to do the judging that same night so there was a really tight window and basically it came down to the fact we all couldn't fly. Yeah. And, uh, and Scotty being a freaking legend of human being as he was, he was like, all yours brother. And I'm like, dude, I, we haven't even fucking met since last week. And excuse me. It's and, my, uh, yeah. it was a really big deal. We'd both spent a huge amount of time. In fact, Scotty spent more time than me organizing the whole thing. And I was just like, Oh, what do I do? You know, like, and he's like, well, I live in WA, man. I can come back and you've never been here and you might never. And I was like, well, yeah, but this is kind of your deal. And you drove me out here and, you know, you've organized the whole damn thing. And so I'm glad he did because then he took that shot, which I've been sent. <laughs> One of the gold in, uh, you got, I think that did a few rounds, didn't it? Back it did quite a few rounds then, which, yeah, that's, um, that's sort of a big part of it. So, so Scotty, how, how would you, um, sort of describe that that first trip we did to shark bay like it, that was quite a exploratory one wasn't it yeah it was it was pretty intense because um um i mean we just met but we we fitted in pretty pretty well but you you know you're both on a budget you're paying by the hour so when you're exploring and assessing oh, a minute. <laughs> yeah a minute you you know and you're exploring and it's costing you you know 20 bucks a minute or or whatever it is um you know, you've really got to both trust each other and each other's instincts because um, it's both your money on the line. And um, but we, Paul's like me, we just like to send it. So you know, there was no. There was no <laughs> that, means go, that means go for it in English. And I'm like, well, and there was, you sleep when you're dead. You can uh, you can you know max out the credit card and worry about it later. And <laughs> so we there was no big tornadoes. Weren't we on one of them? Yeah, yeah, we we um. It was funny because we had about a 21-year-old pilot and a uh, really nice guy. His name is Ryan, and, uh, but he only just learned how to fly. And, um, 
and so we, we, yeah, we, he, he was asking us some questions that we thought, shouldn't the pilot know that? <laughs> uh, we don't want to answer that for you, but, um, but yeah, we had, we had a ball and, um, yeah, we, we, we both have that attitude as to let's just go and explore and see what happens, you know, and, and most of the time it pays off and you've got to be prepared for sometimes coming back with not much and an empty pocket or an empty wallet. But, um, I'd much rather try and, and, and give it a go than, than take the safe bet, which is what we did on that trip. And so, so by having a go means throwing down two and a half thousand dollars on a flight to a place you've never been and don't know if it's going to be any good because, because you don't know if anyone's been there before and you haven't seen any shots. So having a go is for people that live on uh, like I do on a, on a smell of an oily rag, that's kind of a big deal. So, so there's a lot of pressure and excitement about, getting something that hasn't been shot before which Scott right. and I in particular have been drawn to a lot and Scotty's an absolute master at, at Google earthing places and, and coming up with ideas and new places that, that sort of haven't been done not only here but we've had lots of conversations of places around the world yes um, yeah. here and, and all sorts of countries what are some of the places that you've, you've scouted out Scotty we've, we've been looking at um, Peru India um... Libya is it Bolivia, yeah, Bolivia is a big one. That, that, but I think it might be a couple of years before we're uh, before we're anywhere out there. But um, yeah, I mean, there's just I tell you one thing with COVID that's just happened though is it really yeah I already knew WA in Australia was pretty beautiful, but um, you know, one hell of a place to be stranded as an aerial photographer because um, <laughs> we just got some of the best material in the world here. So um, I'm, I feel quite lucky to be stuck here. And so, so Scotty and I started at probably what I would still say, if you hadn't shot aerials in WA before, is still probably the single most proficient and epic kind of aerial location in WA, and arguably Australia, which is which is which is Shark Bay, and that's Shark Bay World Heritage Area. It's about ten hours north of Perth, and I know because I've done that drive nonstop with Scotty a number of times. <laughs> And, and again, on my own, uh, um, which is pretty scary when you've got roofs on the road and you're in a hurry. Uh, don't recommend that, but um, we've done it. Yes. But it's, it's, I mean, why, why is it sort of still up there as one of the premiers? I know it's been shot quite a bit, which when you've been shooting like Scotty and I, we, we don't get as excited about places that have been shot a lot. We're always looking for new places. But I don't know the maths of it, Paul, but I would say it's about half the size of the UK. Like in terms of land mass, it's it's absolutely massive, really, when you look at it on a map. Um, it takes you in the Cessna at full pelt an hour and a half, two hours from edge to edge, just about. Yeah, yeah, close to two. I yeah, close to two. So, and then it's even you know north to south is probably double that. Um, so, I think it's an area we keep on going back, and because it's just got so much material, and it's so diverse because it's got individual coastlines. So it's got your yeah, coastline up on the very east edge, but then it has these other coastlines on the fingers that go out and each one's unique in its own way. So, I mean, we probably spent 25 hours over there, Paul, in... Uh, yeah, but multiple trips. I mean, you've gone back on your own. I've gone back on my own and, and we've been there together. So it's sort of added up quite a bit. And I think, like, it has probably the most phenomenal colour palette of, of blues to, to reds and, and oranges that I've seen in terms of that juxtaposition like it's the bluest blues you can imagine in the known universe and and the reddest reds of the soil i've ever seen anywhere in australia so that's one of the initial kind of strike points it has a whole series of these things called biridas which uh are like i think the bottom is really old um sand dunes like tens of thousands of year old and and different minerals and structures have leaked to the bottom of those sand dunes and they're collected in these in these lower kind of areas and it's changed the mineral structure of the soil there and they're full of um, lots of different um, Cretaceous kind of creatures. And they're called gypsum hollows as well, because they're full of a different mineral called gypsum. And from the air, they just, you can't really notice them on the ground at all. They're, just, just, they're only like one or two feet, maybe three feet lower than what's around them. And you don't get a sense of their structure. But when you get up above, they're like a, Aboriginal paintings just everywhere laid around you. Some of them fill with water like little pools. And as you'll see in some of our shots, you know, they create some of the famous ones just north of um, uh, the airport really is the Blue Pool and, and um, what are the other names for them, Scotty, the pools up there? Um, Big Lagoon. Um, Big Lagoon, that's right. I, I remember the first shot I saw from there was from Tony Hewitt and I was just like absolutely blown away. And, um, and there's, a, there's quite a few pools like that. That's one of the more round ones. But 
it just puts that like like Paul was saying, this blue with this red. I've just no, I, I don't I don't think I've seen anything like it anywhere else in the world. It's very unique. And I think for me, I mean, I've got to admit also that one of the greatest inspirations that I ever had to even attempt aerial photography, I had done some already on my own in America and a few places, but what really brought me in was the exhibition by Andy Five called Inscription that was based on Shark Bay. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Absolutely, purely abstract, phenomenal, crazy, creative color range. Because having going, it wasn't until I went there I realized hey, that's not purple, <laughs> that's actually green. Or yeah. like, that's not orange, that's actually brown, or you know, whatever it was. So so it made me realize that they'd actually taken a lot of creative license on, on their color palette in particular. And that they were quite unashamedly just exploring themselves as artists in this medium by taking the brakes off and just going anywhere they wanted in terms of how they processed and presented the final work. And... I don't think of, to this day, I don't know if I've ever seen a caliber of exhibition that high in terms of both the physical quality of the prints as well as the phenomenally innovative nature of the work. And I saw that in person when I was judging up in Queensland uh, and I went into one of the galleries there and I was just, for about two weeks, I was just like, <laughs> I want to do some of that, baby. Yeah. And I actually went there on my own first, I think. Um, or Yeah, it might have been actually before we went, Scotty. Or I don't know, I'm getting mixed up. But um, to give you a sense of how prolific it can be, I created an entire book, entire photo book out of one shoot at Shark Bay. One yeah. photo. Yeah. Ah. So it has, it, has the, it has these incredibly intricate, um, and really abstract looking waterways with all different sort of shallow levels, which changes the, the hues of the blues and all sorts of directions and greens. And it has these beautiful seagrasses that run through. Yeah, some of the biggest seagrass fields in the world, isn't it? Like yeah, some of the biggest in the world, some of the biggest population of dugongs in the world. It has uh, one of the most hypersaline environments on the planet in terms of how, how high a salt content it is there, which is what I actually based the premise on my book on, um, which we've got floating around somewhere. I'll pull it out in a bit. What sort of um, time of day and, and weather conditions do you want for shooting somewhere like Shark Bay? When we go and do these trips, Nick, we, you know, we obviously know we're going to invest quite a bit of money. So we go up there with enough arsenal to start World War Three, probably enough weaponry. Um, so we, we quite often go up with just about every camera we can get our hands on, medium format, full frame. Um, and we're trying to get cameras that have really good low light capability because we do want that early morning or late evening shots where the shadows and the depth is there. And that requires us to have, you know, cam we, you know cameras that are going to handle 400, 800, 1500 ISO really well. Um, so that's sort of the challenge, isn't it, Paul, is getting our, getting our dirty little hands on, on camera systems like that. that we yeah, Scotty's much better than me. We've got a great relationship with um, oh, Ben Walton at, um, what's the name of the store again? Um, we've got Ben at um, Team Digital. Team Digital. Um, so basically, they're, they're, they're really supportive of their local photographers and, and they have built a lot of community around them. And yeah. walking in as a stranger, I instantly felt like it was like, what can we do for you? How about you? We line out you this, this lens and camera, so you just try it out. And I'm just like, whoa, I've never experienced this before. You know, like I just walked in the door, but you know, they knew who I was and that was enough and, and out we went. And, you know, over the years, Scotty and I have hired slash borrowed, you know, phase ones and Pentex systems and Fuji systems. And Scotty's done a test run on the, on the latest kind of Hasselblad system, medium format system when it came out. Uh, and I've used obviously the high end Nikon systems, the eight tens and so on. And also I've been using the five DSR for a lot of my shootings. So, so we've actually tried out, quite a large range of, of, of equipment and either now or somewhere during tonight we'll, we'll sort of reflect back on on the what where's and why's of what we did so going back to that very first Kalgoorlie story this is part of the fun is Scotty had borrowed this Pentax uh, for this trip this Pentax 645 which at the time was brand new and I'd never used it and I was just going up there with my 20 men cannons because that's all I had and he was like, not only did he give, gift the flight to me, given up his own seat, he gave me his camera as well. And he's like, there you go, why don't you take this as well? And I was like, you've got to be joking. But this was like, 
how to use it, Paul. First. It was like a few minutes before we took off, and I had no idea how to freaking use it. And so I went up there, and I was like, oh, I was pretty excited, you know, this is going to be awesome. And I started shooting with it, and I took a shot, and it'd be like, Nothing's coming up, and it took like thirty seconds for the photograph to come up, oh, and it my. looked all weird. And I was like, "Oh no!" And I started looking at all the settings, and I was like, "You know, twenty dollars, forty dollars, eight dollars, hundred dollars, two hundred dollars has gone past before I'm taking a photo." And I'm just going, "Oh my god!" And I managed to take about five photos, and and like. 10 minutes of flying over like epic stuff thinking, Oh, I've got this epic opportunity. And they were all completely screwed up. Multiple exposures. It turned it was out in double exposure mode. And oh. it took us about 25 minutes when we landed to even figure out what mode it was in. It was like oh, the sub menu no. or the sub menu or something else that it was like, and I was like, Oh my God, what a disaster in the end. So lesson, lesson learned. Don't run into a very expensive flight with a camera you never used before. Try the damn thing out. But That's a huge lesson, yes. I managed to get, out of those five or six images that I got, two gold awards out of yeah. those yeah. double exposures because they were actually really cool. <laughs> like, I never would have even tried it in a million years on my own or ever had the balls to even do double exposures in an aerial flight. You know? so, so it was kind of like this double-edged part of it wasn't it scotty and like um oh it's pretty funny really i didn't tell anyone it was a complete disaster and i just well you were so disappointed on the ground and uh and then yeah i was a few months later you pick up a gold with a double exposure that was a complete accident but it was actually <laughs> two golds with two double exposures <laughs> uh, <laughs> like and if you don't know so much like getting getting golds in the afp system is is not easy just, just for everyone to lean towards that kind of camera is when you're doing 200K an hour or 220 kilometers an hour in a Cessna banked with wind buffeting through, you you don't have much time to set up your composition. Um, you're sort of zipping over it and everything's happening very quickly. Um, so you really want to harvest data, crisp data, and then you, you're cropping into it later on. You very rarely get it you know bang on but i'll give paul credit you know when i first started shooting with paul coming from film days i'm pretty much digital i dabble with film a little bit um paul's amazing when i watch him shoot you know it's one of the things he he's you know pretty much every shot's lined up and composed but in aerial photography that does become harder so these bigger sensor medium format cameras um are a lot handier for us because we're quite often losing 20 or 30 percent of the image um, it's also why a lot of aerials are square crop because that medium format ratio is closer to square crop. So it sort of suits us when we're cutting in. Um, so that's why we tend to lean towards that format. Now with cameras getting up to like 45, 50 megapixels anyway, um, you know, you've still got that data there. But um, the colour depth on the medium format is also really nice. But yeah, that's, that's why that pen tax was so important for us. It allows us to cut into that image because we're always going to lose a little bit of it. You know, you're shooting at F5 or F6. You're going to maybe have a bit soft edges. You're shooting on a weird plane. So you're always cutting a bit off the outside of the cake um, to get to the good bit, aren't you, Paulie? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's I mean, the composition has changed every second. And yeah. the likelihood, like, in a perfect world, I'd fly a chopper everywhere. And I'd say, oh, stop, please. Oh, can you go a bit lower? Actually, just go a little bit left and just hold it. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Oh, why don't I just do a six-image panorama here? And it's like, well, for $1,600 or $2,000 an hour, you can do that. Uh, or $3,000 in, um, in uh, Iceland. But, yep. you know, on the budget we're on, not only are we in a Cessna, but we're usually in a Cessna that's designed for one person to shoot. <laughs> Yeah, with a window, you know, uh, eight, just a window. Yeah, and a wing and a wheel strut in a way, like an X right in front of you. So you're uh, trying to maximize um, your ability to just sort of harvest the images and then in post be able to cut in and get what you want because it's very rarely perfect, is it, Paul? Straight off the yeah, bat. Yeah, that's it. So, so sometimes you know, in order to get that top down look, we're not completely top down. So you need to do a bit of perspective warping, and in which case. Well, Scotty knows how to do it. I don't have a freaking clue, but oh, I'll show you. But that eats that eats into some of your file structure, is my point. Or you might catch a wheel or part of the wing in the shot, or you know, you get a certain reflection, or you just haven't actually managed to get exactly over the top of the structure you want to photograph because it's so hard at a plane. Because 
this is when we when we're flying and we're shooting this is our flight plan freaking spaghetti bolognese yeah <laughs> anytime we get to a feature that we want to shoot and scotty and i are both very consistent that we really much prefer a top-down more abstract um perspective is you've got to bank way way over and as soon as you bank over the plane starts turning so it's a huge issue trying to relate to the pilot where you want to be um you know and we are shooting out the window with the winds at 200 k's an hour and flying 180 k's an hour if you don't get it right you know you, it's you might have one second where you're close to the composition or you might not get it at all so in some ways it's a little bit about data capturing especially for someone with kind of scotty's vision scotty do you want to maybe i don't know how close that is but just we were talking about that process of composition shooting if we have a little bit of that raw footage just to give you an idea of what it's like banking over in a plane and and you yes. see me with, I think, with a GoPro on my head, kind of. Um, I'll, I'll show you. I think I've got a flappers. Paul wore a GoPro on one of our shark base suits, and it just shows you how feverish um, it can be um, when you're going for it. I think this one, Paul, I don't know if you guys can see that. It's not quite coming up big screen, Scotty. It's sharing? It's sharing fine, but um, it's still looking like a small. A little Is thumbnail it? rather than opening up. Yeah, okay. Let's see if I can fix it. But, um, no, we're not looking at... No, not... you can't see it, Nick? No, I can't see it, mate, at all. Is it coming up big on your screen, Scotty? It's just a, it's just a little small thumbnail with a grey grayed out on ours. Yeah, I don't know if that'll work, eh? Hey? All right, well, well, we'll go to plan B. But, um... it, worked, it worked in pre-testing. Yeah. <laughs> You want to, um, like Scotty, I've got a few of those sort of original trip um, shark bay shots. So I thought like, it's been half an hour and we haven't shown a photo yet. So maybe um, yeah. I don't know who wants to start. Whether you've got some from that area or, or you want me to start off and you. Go for it, man. Or, yeah, go for it. What do you prefer, my friend? You're uh, you're the rock star, rock star of the show here, mate. Uh, you you what do you what are we what are we doing again? I wasn't listening. Um, <laughs> got a few shots of shark bay. <laughs> uh, I do that a lot. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm guessing. Can you see my screen, you guys? Yeah, yep. I can see yours perfectly. Yeah, so to give you an idea of just briefly the kind of um, color palettes you're working with, so you've got um, you've got the salt works, which have the most beautiful, intricate detail. This is the first time I shot with what I consider a real camera. This is a phase one, and this was at the time when the 50 megapixel back was was the bee's knees. And like the file structure and the level of refined detail and the color rendition that you have to work with is it's literally just feels like, you know, cream running down your screen. Like, and when I compare it to say like the files from my five DSR, they're like crunch, crunchy, raw, um, you know, coconut shells, you know, that rough skin on the outside in terms of when you get down to the file structure, whereas something like a phase one has they're so beautifully refined and so elegant and there's so much potential to reach in and open out the different areas of the file it's amazing what capacity it lets, gives you to do in post materials doesn't it paul like i mean even though full frame are catching up and getting the 45 50 megapixels the color depth and the rendition you get off some of the medium format lenses and sensors just still can't be beat when, when you're pick up that delicateness of the, of the landscape from the air. So Scotty picked out this feature and, and at the time it wasn't so well known. It's pretty well known now and been shot quite a lot, but um, how many times did we have to go around it in that dappled light to try and get a shot where it was actually in the sun? <laughs> we found, we found the spot. It turns out I think a couple of people had shot it before, but it was quite a long time ago. So we were so excited when we found it um, because it was just, we'd never seen anything like it and we got it in dappled light. So, I think we did probably about 20 circles in the, in the set. And there's only, I think, three of them or maybe four of them where the light was actually where we want it to be. So you can't just stop and wait for the light to get right when you're flying around. So not only is it about waiting for the light, it's about whether you're at the right angle when that light actually reaches the feature. So you can kind of see at the top, that's, that's kind of in shadow, and, and this kind of is at the bottom, and it just hit on this point on this particular probably round number 17. And so... 17 rounds is, is like, you know, 500 bucks. <laughs> What's quite cool, guys, 
Liverpool about about this. Is this a shot about six years ago now, Paul, or whatever it is? Yeah, yeah about six, maybe seven even. I've seen images from there recently in the last six months to a year, and it's completely changed. And that's yeah, what's cool about some of the low-lying tidal areas of Shark Bay. Um, it changes. So, it you know, that may never exist again like that, um, which I think is part of what makes us quite... Um, quite addicted to aerial photography isn't it you know because you you yeah that does not exist anymore that's gone and nick you were, you were asking early on and we didn't quite answer it yet but we will is you know what time of day and when do you go and why mm. so there's other aspects of shark bay that make it really uh, versatile in that it's actually really nice to shoot the waterways in higher light yeah because the angle is a lot more vertical and it reaches down deeper into the water and it reflects mm. off the sand bottoms and pulls all this color out that doesn't exist on those earlier and more angled lights, lighting yeah. sort of situations. And also mm -hmm. those lower angles create a lot of reflection, which means 50% of your loop, it's not going to work anyway. That's um, right. Because you're going to, it's going to bounce back on you. I mean... You can shoot at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of these are. Like, so when we get, say, say we hit some of the land-based stuff early, and it's quite subtle because it's still quite a flat landscape, relatively speaking. Uh, but you can see, you know, just the subtle edging of light that makes a difference to these very, very small features just gives it a lot of tactile depth. Yeah. And that yeah. wouldn't exist in high light. Another right. advantage. Because yeah. you can get away with this shooting this place in much higher light because it's largely the water yeah. and it brings more of the colours out. So it's a little bit about planning your loops and where you go quite strategically in terms of what's, what, going, to make, what's going to make the most of it. You, you speak What the conditions are as well, Paul. Um, because we, we've shot a lot in wind there as well, haven't we? Where the wind, because the water's so shallow, it blows that beautiful textured water. You see um, the up there. Yeah, that's right. Up, up yeah. that. So you can even shoot when it's windy, which might have put you off on, on other locations, where it's there, you get up and you get this beautiful texture on the water. So it's, yeah, you, you can really shoot at any time. What about... So here's, um, uh, here's Scotty doing, doing just that. Like, oh, sorry, Nick. You go. I was just going to say, um, do you use um, polarizers at times? I mean, obviously they cut down the light and yeah, that's to make it difficult. But uh, those no, midday shots look a bit polarized. No, the, we 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 don't because it, it, we we'd rather have the stop of light. Yeah. You know, so we we're sometimes shooting that sort of close on the edge. We'd rather the shutter speed and the light coming in than so we we normally steer clear, don't we, Paul? Yeah, I haven't. I've, I've just decided that there's enough capability in, in the files to pull out the colours you sort of want. Um, I do know people that do, but we're usually really pushing the limit of the ISO and trying to keep the ISO down because, you know, when you, when you go into the trouble of shooting with, you know, high-end systems, you, you want to make the most of their capability, which is keeping the ISO really low. And particularly in these early shoots, there wasn't as much ISO capability in, in those earlier models of, of phase mm. ones and, and, and Pentaxes, for instance, um, and particularly the five DSR. I don't shoot on that camera over ISO 400. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even bother. Um, another one of the, the favorite elements of, of Shark Bay is, is the salt works in, in terms of like, you can just see that subtle difference. You know, again, that's just the time of day really makes a photograph like that. Yeah. And, that golden light, we shot this um, about an hour before sundown, wasn't it? A half an hour, I think. And so you just had this beautiful golden light um, coming off all those little uh, runways for the vehicles. Um, which do, one do, you, do you remember this is one of those sketchy uh, pilot moments where basically he's not allowed to fly in and around cloud and where we wanted to shoot, <laughs> it was getting covered in cloud and we are like... Oh, and he was like, oh, I'm not really meant to do this. We're like, oh, yeah, it's not there any that much further. Just, oh, just, we'll just go a little bit. And and we didn't know if it was going to be any good because it was kind of mainly covered in cloud. And then, you know, thank goodness, he, he balls it up and, and he went out there and, and he was felt safe enough. But then when we got there, boom, the shafts of light came out like this that weren't there before. And we just got absolute jackpot, didn't we, Scotty? Yeah, it was, yeah, like just, yeah. You know, it's always being willing to go up in any condition, and we were rewarded that day. Um, with it, yeah, it was that was amazing that shoot. So, this but, is an idea of keeping track. So, Scotty's a bit of a master at, at pre planning trips and getting really clear about the kind of uh, points of interest we want to get to and then planning a direction. But 
I remember one time we had a plan and we started going and all of a sudden the clouds were coming straight at us and we went, Oh, that's not going to work. And we literally turned around and, and completely went opposite straight away. So we could race ahead of the cloud. Yeah. So yeah. Our best laid plans just went out the window within like five minutes. Yeah. And you've got, you've got to have backup upon backup plan because you fly around for 10 minutes and you know, you don't want to burn that money. So yeah, doing you, I use um, zoom earth and you know, Google images and, and you know, I'll spend hours, if not days, for a big shoot, you know, where we're going away for a week, just taking screenshots, putting its GPS position down, and then coming up with a flight path. But then maybe a flight path, if that's not good, we'll go this way because that's the quickest way to go. So you've got all these sort of um, backup plans so that you're maximising your money and your time spent in the air. I mean, if we were millionaires, I wouldn't give a damn and we'd just waste our money, wouldn't we, Paul? I was going to say, um, oh, here's Scotty in action. This was actually the video that I had that I had on my GoPro. So if you can't tell, that's a pretty long way <laughs> over. At about, I don't with... know what angle that is, but that's that's like bath material pretty much yeah. uh, for, the, for the faint of heart. And The other thing is getting a pilot. The pilots vary, and some pilots aren't comfortable putting the plane in a real big – because what we want is we want a bank but we want to go slow as well because we feel like keeping our lunch down. Um, so you're having to bank and go slow, which for a pilot, a pilot's got to feel confident. So, you you know, it's good when you find a good pilot. It's good to work in with the pilot, make them feel comfortable because then you can get some of these sweeping shots, can't you, Paul, um, where they're really riding the limit of the, of the Cessna to keep it up in the air. And it's actually essentially when you bank like this, it's a controlled fall or even coming close to stall in the plane. So you, you're dropping in altitude quite a lot as well, which is one of the other factors. So if you do it too much, all of a sudden you're, you're getting a lot closer to the ground and it's coming up pretty fast. This Some right. pilots can like feather a plane over where they can actually hold it over a certain amount of degrees on a certain wind angle and just keep, keep the plane at a slight angle while going straight. Not many. I know the pilot that um, Tony Hewitt and those guys use is, is pretty good at that. What's his name? Roger. Yeah, Roger, I don't remember. It's the by sea project. But anyway, there are parts, like, you know, but what happens is, I think we've seen on other shows, when you go to these remote places, there's pretty much, it's quite consistent. You get some grumpy old person that runs a business that probably should have retired 20 years ago. And then you'll get these brand new green as bean pilots that haven't flown just about anywhere. And they're the pilots. So I can probably think of six places off the top of my head that are exactly like that every time, even when I go back. It's, it's, it's the same deal. It's a, and it's a fine line. I think the, the best way I've found or with Paul is really making sure that they're involved. Um, you know, so they're involved with the decision-making process. Um, they're involved with, you know, with feeling comfortable with where they're going. And then it sort of becomes an adventure with all three of us rather than us just barking orders at someone. Um, you know what I mean? I think you get a better experience for the pilot and everyone involved. There's us uh, racking up our systems. Yeah, there's and, a... Uh, this is a 210, isn't it, with the door off, Scotty, I think? Yeah, that's a phase, a Nikon, a Pentax, all in... And there's, a, and there's a 5DSR in there as well somewhere. So so often we I usually shoot with two bodies, and they're not always going to be the same. So sometimes I've got to shoot with two systems, which is a little bit risky. And I know, what's your favourite combination, Scotty, of lenses? Uh, I shoot mainly prime Um now um and i i i tend to stick around 80 to 110 mil you know that's sort of my sweet spot um anything wider than 80 if you're in a cessna with wheels is going to foul the wheels normally um you know you're gonna you're gonna pick that up in your shot so that's normally what i try and hang around with um and i try and stick to primes really um just because i've had movement on zoom rings um when we're when we're shooting so mm. So here's an example of what Scotty was talking about, being really inclusive with the pilot and spending like half an hour before we even get off the ground to get on the same page about where we want to go, how long for, what's the fuel range, you know, do we have the capacity to stretch it further if the light's really good or a bunch of whales turn up? Do you have another flight afterwards you have to get back for? Is there a time limit? And so there's a lot of things in the air. Uh, sometimes I've gone to places that we can't fly because suddenly there's a military exclusion zone and they're doing an exercise randomly and, and they don't give any airport more than a couple of hours notice anywhere, anytime. So you can't predict it. Yeah. And that one time we were literally, how many tornado or cyclones was there? It was at least two 
yeah, we had... around us at the same time, and we were, and they literally went around Shark Bay on either side, and we were in the tiniest window in the middle trying to get some flights in, just going, oh my god, and other places up and down the coast were just getting wasted. But you can't. Um, you can't be afraid to, you know, re- it's really key to work in with that pilot and talk to him. Don't be afraid to tell him to bank or her, bank a little bit more or or head back because, um, you know, you, you can miss some opportunities. It's, it, communication with the pilot is key. This is a barrier that I was talking about, those, those very, very shallow depressions or gypsum hollows that hold a really different mineral structure. And this looks like the Starship Enterprise to me. I love it. <laughs> or, or a kiwi bird or something. So it's right yeah. up my sort of alley. Uh, so that's one of the beautiful features. This is the famous brain. This is one of the images, one of the places that Tony Hewitt shot and 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 used it as follow that one Australian photographer of the year was a top down shot of, of this coastline here with an edge of, of part of that. Um, yes, and that's on an island. Is it Fowler Island? F O U R E, I think it is. Fowler Fow- Sill, I think it's called. I think it's east of Denham. And it's probably one of the most beautiful islands i've ever seen from the air it is incredible isn't it yeah, it looks like a big tadpole but when you get over the top it looks like a brain scotty's got a few shots that look very sort of brain like so i'm going to hurry up and get out sometimes you know if you get really still conditions you can get beautiful reflections in the water and this is an example where dappled light like i remember one morning it was dappled light and scotty's like yeah i don't know man and i was like oh i might give it a go and it was one of the few times we did a split and i sort of went up and took a gamble. And I didn't know how it was going to go. It could have been rubbish. And when, you, when you've got like a few thousand dollars on the line, you're sort of like, oh, oh this is a bit risky. And, yeah. and I've done it since when it didn't work, actually, Scotty. But that time it worked out reasonably well. You can see the dappled light is a very different kind of beast to be dealing with. Mm. Um, and you're not always sort of going to have a lot of say around that. Is our lovely dunes. Anyway, Scotty, your, your turn to share a few, mate. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I've got loaded up, Paulie. I don't have. Um... We'll have a look, and if you want to, I can keep showing some more. But if you've got something that's that's maybe right, I'm, match. Gonna, I'm gonna pop out and have a look. Oh, yeah, this was what? part of my folio that won uh, commercial photography of the year uh, in Tassie the first time, I think. Again, that was so much about depth of light and the timing at the same time, and and you can get out there and easily miss both. Um, and that's probably a slightly more obtuse sort of angle. So I might have been pushing the the uh, aperture up to maybe f f you know, over five point six, maybe a bit higher. Um, and that burst of light and that reflection on that salt pan allowed me to do that. It gave me enough light to push it up because we're not we're not generally shooting under you know sixteen hundredths of a second if we can help it. Uh, that's my that's my comfort zone. I come down to a thousand. I, ha- I sometimes shoot it at uh, eight hundred if I'm really, really pushing it and I'm quite back inside the plane and I'm not in the wind flow. But if there's one setting you don't compromise on, no matter what, it's, it's shutter speed. That's what will take you out every time. And, and Scotty and I have learned the hard way. And Scotty, what's your, uh, what's your other hard lesson? I remember a very hard lesson being in the back of the plane with you with a certain lens. That was a manual, I think. What's that with it moving? And it's uh, like he took a gamble on, on, getting the, the manual focus lens bang on and leaving it there for the whole flight. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yes, I, I, I basically pinged it technically near infinity or on infinity, so it should have been all right. And I, I left it there because I was going to – and it must have bumped and moved. So, um, you know, like 100 images just all slightly slightly gone. And I'm a picky, picky bugger when it comes to that. So, um, you know – It's a very, very gentle way to describe the experience that I remember. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was devastated. I mean, because, yeah, you like, yeah, and that's why we're so careful. We do all our testing before we go up in the air. You'll see me running down the runway with the camera moving at speed, shooting at the ground, and I look like a crazy person. Yeah, but um, there's, a re- there's a reasoning behind it because I'm testing my settings to see if they'll track and keep things focused. So these days I just test and test and test because you do not want to do an hour or two-hour flight and be 1200 bucks down with soft images. Um, so, and you can avoid it. It's just, yeah, I, like Paul's experience with the Pentax, hadn't used it before, jumps up in the plane and it bit him. Um, you know, so yeah, you want to be comfortable with your camera, know how it works, and then go for it. Yeah, so that one before was the, the seagrasses I was talking about, which are all around through the open bay. So 
if you can only fly during the middle of the day or for some reason you're there and you're going for a short stint, it's still well worth doing. And there's a lot of places that I wouldn't say that's the case. Um, but I think WA with its salt pans and other things, it, it, it opens up a lot more options. And I've actually now started shooting a lot of salt pan work in higher light. Um, so I can make sure I can shoot at ISO 100 the entire time and even like F8 and just nail everything. And because of the, the salt pans don't have almost any sort of physical structure to them or dimension, the side light's not really going to help it. Uh, no. You know, I'm going to stop sharing Scotty because I want to see something else. Oh, here I am um, trying to rock star a few camera systems. <laughs> yeah. At, at once. There we go. What have I got there? Nikon 810. Uh, that looks like a Pentax. And I'm not even, that might be my 5DSR, I think. <laughs> So we're often juggling and sharing things and trying out different systems. And, you know, on a lot of the drive there, we're practicing out the window, you know, with fast moving things, you know, 10 hour drive is perfect time to just get your sense of the rhythm and movement. We stop at a few sort of uh, the sand dune areas on the way to get a few test areas. So testing, testing, testing is, is crucial. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stop sharing Scott, because I want to see some. Yeah, I'll see if I can um, I'll see if I start to potentially do if this pops up for you guys, but, um, well, you could show that video too, Scotty, if, if that suits. Yeah. I, I hope it works poorly. I'll, I'll, I'll well, check. No, work, it's the same as before. Okay. Um, we'll give tell, it a tell story about that anyway, Scotty. What's that? Is that work? Yeah. The scar, the, um, the, the skateboard gig. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. It, that didn't work. Did it guys? When I popped that up. No, I, is it the same one though? I'm taking it down now. Um, Let's see if it's if it's on a different window that you have to share. It'll be there somewhere. Yeah. Okay. I'll try again. Um, <laughs> uh, love love a good rope. Love is that going out poorly or is that? Yeah, that's coming up. Oh yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All yep. right. This is a um, this is a video that I did about four years ago for a skateboard company in the States. Um, it was a really cool gig, came by Instagram, um, which has been a really awesome platform for me. Um, you, yeah, I've, I've got some of the coolest little gigs. This is one of them. These guys approached me. They wanted uh, six images for the back of some skateboards and said, can we commission six off you? I said, you certainly can. They said, we'll pay you. And I went, oh, good. I probably would have given it to them anyway. And... Um, and they sent me six of the boards and then they uh, rang me up and said, look, we need you to do a video because every year we have a featured artist. Um, so I said, sure, um, pay me enough money to go up north with someone and we'll do a road trip. And it was a great opportunity to, to sort of show what we do. So I'll load it up. You guys can see that? Yeah. It'll jump around a bit probably, but see how it goes. My name's Scott John. It's all shot in Shark Bay and Cowberry. Now specialized in aerial imagery. That's one of the lagoons. I did a lot of drawing work, didn't you, Scotty, on this one? Yes, we did. Blind, yeah. Especially landscape. Um, Brooke Rushton came with me and stuff. shot the whole thing, and, and it was great. Four, 500 kilometers away in the middle of nowhere. With no nice for, uh, Jake's point there, Scotty. Another story. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, Monkey Meyer area. You see how red that soil is? Unbelievable. That's the journey and the areas that you may stop off along the way that are unplanned. Oh, so I love that car, Scotty. Which is the most beautiful yeah. experience. Canola so, Fields, that's Calberry. I think if you're having amazing experiences. Rockstar, Rockstar. What do you think, Millie? <laughs> so that's the airport. There you go. From another little Cessna. That, is that, that the 210, Scotty? Sorry, mate. Is that the 210? Yes, yeah, it was. You can go anywhere you'd like and you can shoot. Oh, the Schneider lens. Is that, is that the Schneider 80 mil, Scotty? Yeah, it was, mate. That was a beautiful combo. Oh, that's the best lens I've ever used, I reckon. The merging of new technology, man, conquering the sky. Yeah. But then I'm photographing an ancient landscape. Oh, you can see the bear it is in the background. That's it. I mean, it's just an amazing it's place, isn't it, Paul? Is a beautiful landscape. Uh, yeah, it's it's hard to beat as a, as a single destination, really. Dramatic and revealing. Look at those blue eyes. Wow. Oh, here's the salt works. The famous salt works. 
it's like someone's painted it with a brush. Oh, there's a, there's a water tree, I call it. Yeah, yeah. It looked quite different there, didn't it? Photograph for a lot longer. Yeah, it was cool. And then my skateboards. Oh, yeah. Have you still got them? Yeah, I've still got them. I haven't ridden them because I'll probably kill myself, but I've still got them. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, that that was a good – that's a good example of um, – of how diverse, isn't it, Paulie? Um, plug my uh, camera. Camera I'll show you. Um, this is something that I took there. Um, I don't know if that's popped up on the screen, but um, is that working? Still looking at the uh, the close up of one of the skateboards at the moment. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I don't know what I don't know what's with that, but um, oh, that does that work? Oh, there we go. Oh, my Lord. I remember this coming up on the judging. I was right. like, holy smoke balls. Yeah. Well, it didn't be. It didn't, but that was taken in, um, yeah, in Shark Bay, just just over the waterways where a lot of seagrass is. And um, I, I love abstracts. I'm, I'm big into my abstracts. So these kind of areas for me are just the playground. I love them. Um, but, I, yeah, I saw a tiger cub coming yep. out. Um, but, unfortunately, four of the judges, I think, on – it was didn't, didn't see it, damn it. Uh, I was in the back of the room when it came up, Scotty, and I was almost like wanted to go up and slap a few around the chops. I was just like, hey, it's the look, risk. Look, it's the risk you take, you know. It, it, you know, so, sometimes it stand, it stares at me, um, but you know, someone else can't see it. And you, it's really the first look at the image. If they don't see it the first time, you know, straight away, then you've you've not got them. Um, but I, I like that with my kind of my style that I do. I like trying to find shapes or characters. Um, I, I saw a sort of praying mantis head in this one, Scotty. That's, that's what it came through for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, that's it, man. Like you, um, just trying to see if. Yeah. I, I definitely saw the, the tiger before you even said it. So it was, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It jumped straight out at me. Yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, judges didn't have their coffee yet. Yeah, this is another part. I don't know if that's popped up. Yeah. Well, you've got the selection there. Yeah. So I oh, don't. Okay. So, the, but it's not. Why are you clicking? You clicking wishbone? Yeah, wishbone. Is that popped up? No. No, it's just small still. Yeah, I know. I know. I, know, I figured it out now. Hey, that could work. Yeah. yeah? No. Nah. Didn't work. Yeah, right. No, you're right. not sharing at the moment. You're not uh, sharing at the moment, so. Oh, gee. Yeah. Hey. Oh, there you go. Oh my God. Yeah, that's um. So, so when you go to Shark Bay, you've sort of got the you've got the main ponds, which they, which they I think farm quite often, which is your light blues, and um and a lot of your white salt, and that's the area a lot of people you take off from the airport. It's 15 minutes straight out there, and you shoot. But if you go about another five minutes south, um, there's these other ponds, and I'm not sure of the use of them, Paul. I don't know if they're the pre-stage ponds or maybe it's where the overflow goes, um, but they're incredible. They're, they're, um, the, the colour diversity is, is huge. Um, so we they're, often, they're often a lot darker and deeper colours, aren't they, Scotty? Yes, they are, and these beautiful cracking in the landscape. So we spent... Um, a fair bit of time over there and it's worth having a look. Um, it's one of those places where you can't really access it with a drone. Um, it's, it's, you know, you're, you, you've really got to fly to a national park as well in a lot of areas or an active mine site. Um, so it is one of those areas where you, you, if you do want to get to it, you're pretty much having to hire the aircraft and shoot from the aircraft. Um, and that's something that Paul and I have learned a fair bit moving into drone photography as well is there's pros and cons you know i mean technically a drone should be more flexible but um there's there's some there's many no fly zones for drones mining sites are one of them they're geofenced so whereas the planes you fly over um so there's things to consider when you're going on a mission um if you're purely thinking of drone it's a good idea to figure out where you can and can't fly and yeah, there's a lot of places you can't. I think yeah, as, as later in the show, we'll, we'll probably or whenever it comes up naturally, we'll, we'll get sort of more in depth around that because Scotty and I basically launched. We 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 were hands off on drones most of the time. Like what are these little ee, 
little things that take tiny little crappy files and we, we just weren't interested. And, you know, when the new Mavic 2 Pro came out, it was like all of a sudden you had 20 meg raw on a Hasselblad camera. And we're like, oh, that's sounding a little bit more usable. And when you're used to these big 50 mil medium, medium um, format files, you don't get too excited about tiny little sensor sort of drone files where, where the dynamic range is a quarter of what you're used to. Um, yeah. But we, we kind of, yeah, we bought them around the same time, didn't we, Scotty? We did, and, and, and it's been a pretty cool experience because we both bought them at the same time and then we went, well, let's go really give these a test. And we, I said, it was near Christmas, I said, fly over and let's do it. And knowing Paul, I didn't have to twist his arm. He's like, yeah, I'll be there in two days. And um, it, was, it, was, it was like that. It was the idea. And I think it was two days before Christmas. And then I booked my ticket on Christmas morning. And I think I left the next day. <laughs> you were here on New Year's, uh, New Year's Day. Yeah, so it was just like, well, okay. You yeah. want to come to WI and do a road trip? 3,000 guys? Why not? Um, and Very good. Yeah, let's go. What to do was we went, right, we'll purely do drones. We'll do nine days. The plan was to go here, Albany, Albany, Esperance, Esperance, Kalgoorlie. So um, we were going to do some salt ponds. We were going to do some coastal esperance. Then we were going to do some mining um, up in Kalgoorlie. And it was uh, beginning of this year, end of last year, and the whole of Australia was on fire. And we knew they were having a lot of fires over, over east, um, but we just didn't know how much they were having here. So we got down to the Stirling Ranges near Albany, and it was a completely no-go zone. It was on fire. Um, I think like a quarter of it burnt down. And I don't know if anyone's been to the Stirling Range. It's a beautiful place. Um, so that was out. So we, we went... We were driving down there, Scotty. We were like, oh, look at those amazing clouds. It's going to be a storm over the top of the Stirlings. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. We looked closer and went, oh, is that, is that a storm? Oh, my God. And the whole place is on fire. And so all of a sudden our plans started going out the window. And, and we had a good friend of ours, Jordan Contello, who's, who's in charge of the scouting, wasn't he? For um... Yeah, Jordan works for the fire department. Yeah, he basically goes out and scouts and, and, and keeps an eye on all these fires. And we were like, any chance we get anywhere near it? And he's like, yeah, no. Nah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that, no. And that, that is a, and I just did my commercial drone pilot's license last week. And basically, it's a flat no around drones, around any sort of emergency situation at all. And you imagine if, if you know, like I've heard stories of where drones have been spotted in emergency situations and they've had to like tell all the choppers to get out of the area. Yep. They're potentially putting all lives at risk. And yep. then all, of, all of a sudden, huge amounts of burnings going on and they could have been saved. And, you know, it's, it's pretty full on. Yeah, you've got to, you've got to respect it. And, um, and you can, you know, log on online at any point and get the information you need, can't you? But uh, we had Jordan, which was a firm... Get the hell out of there! <laughs> Don't go. It's like, yeah, get out of here, boys. I'm the direction for you, lot. What we did is, and what you know, it was like, right, we need a backup plan. And what it meant was, we spent more time on these amazing um, little salt ponds, which I think we did a bit of research. Used to be the Stirling Ranges used to be a massive mountain range, and there used to be a big mountain range in land, and they've eroded away over millions of years, and um, and there used to be sort of rivers flowing down there, didn't there, Paul? And, They've evaporated over the years and left these like little salt ponds. And we didn't understand how vast it was. It is a massive area that these exist. And each one is like a, a treasure hunt. You don't know if it's going to be orange, red, yellow, green. Um, so we went hunting these for uh, for about three or four days. And um, we had a ball, didn't we, Paul? Um, yeah, I just want to give some context to, um, to what we're talking about. Like this is an example of the kind of, you know, on the ground, you just drive past these and don't notice a thing. Yep. And you get in the air and you're like, oh, my goodness. And and you just don't know what you're going to find. Remember, we found the um, – some of them are like physical structures that are, you know, quite built. And, and there's quite a lot of a mixture of yeah, probably mainly actually nature-based ones. There's these huge strings of them just going for kilometres and kilometres. They're all different sizes and different so sort this, of colours and different shapes. So this is a perfect scenario for the drones, right? Because – if we had it been in the aircraft, it would have been too quick. You know, you would have flown over one and you would have had to move the other. But the drones were perfect for this because there were so many scattered over a large area. They gave us time to really concentrate on them and not be burning money by the minute or the hour. Um, but what we quickly learned was that we had to stitch a lot of images because we couldn't go high enough um, to swallow a lot of these single salt ponds or doubles. So... That was where we very quickly learnt about 
how to stitch um, and tie images together to get these compositions that we wanted. So you'll notice I'm kind of I'm going to show mine first because you'll see what a master can do with a file afterwards. So one of the big issues that we have with this was our uh, our our Fanta Lake that we found. <laughs> yeah, I can't see your screen at all, Paul. Oh, you're not looking at my photos. I've, I've got it up on mine. Yeah. What, uh, I can see it on mine. It says I'm, I'm I am screen sharing. Um, yeah, it says you've started screen sharing. It's probably just my inmate. I'm just seeing a black screen. Uh, I don't know, Matt. Matthew, can you see him? Just nod yeah. your head. Yeah, right. Sorry, just yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, I'll keep looking at this blank screen. So this is this is a conversation we come up with quite a lot, or it comes up quite a lot, um, especially around awards time. I look at the my files, and and then I look at what Scotty's done with something, and I just go, "Ah, oh, what did you do? Where did this magic wand come from? How did you?" find this face in it how did you push the dynamic range of this file beyond anything i thought was humanly possible where did that color gamut even how did you even find a way to get it into that realm and scott is a freaking master at all of the above so i think that the you know so you'll notice kind of mine mine are, are pleasant and kind of have a certain appeal to them but when you look at what scott is capable of doing with files and to be honest there is a there, there there's a lot of limitations with these kind of uh, drone files as opposed to the files from the media format systems in particular. Two very different styles as well, you know, but that's what I think makes Paul and I work really well together when we shoot. Um, you know, we really enjoy shooting together because I, I've learned a lot from Paul, but also he sees the world in a different way I do, which then inspires me or helps when I shoot. So, yeah, two very different shooting styles and two different editing styles. Um, but, yeah, some of this is amazing, Paul. But, but yeah, the, the drones, you instantly, when you start editing the drone files coming from, you know, medium format sensor or even, you know, high end full frame is, okay, I can't push it like that. You know, I, I, I go to apply a pre-made setting or something that I've been applying to the medium format and I throw it on the drone file and it just breaks up into pieces. So um, in a way it taught me to be a better photographer again, because I had to start exposing correctly, you know, with the phase cameras, and high dynamic range, I just underexposed because I didn't want to blow the highlights and I just bring it up later. Um, you know, a bit of a lazy way of shooting, but yeah, with these drones, it was like, shit, I've got to really make sure that I'm, that we're both exposing correctly because there's not much room in post. So this one I think was like a, maybe a 25 image stitch. Because we can't go that high, we're literally flying along going ka-ching, 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 taking one little photo with about, 50, between 30 and 50 percent overlap yes. and it's quite tricky to do to like oh where did i start on that bottom right corner or <laughs> where do i finish or or have i gone four photos up or and so it can be a little bit messy if you're not super organized or or pre-visualized about what you're trying to capture so what, you've, got a, you've got a fixed focal length don't you scotty so you don't have a lot of uh, to play with other than height well one thing we did learn so one advantage that you've got on the drones the iso capability is not great but not terrible but it's not not great but the, the gimbal that they've got and the stability on it is amazing. It holds it dead still. So that allows you to lean down on your shutter speed, um, which is what we found. So what we ended up doing is we started doing these multi-stitches and we would fly along and stop the drone, wait for it to settle, take the photo, fly along, stop the drone, wait for it to settle. Good, but it took too much time. We were running out of batteries and then having to come back read batteries so what we actually learned in the end you can go full tilt um pretty much full speed 40k an hour or whatever and just hit the shutter button focus bang and go like a lawnmower up and down the biggest one i did was over one of these salt lakes was 111 images i captured the whole thing oh. um and then what i did is i loaded it into photoshop and now i just cut into it i've probably got like 20 different compositions but i just harvested the whole lot and i'm still hacking into it now you know, yeah. which is a completely different way of shooting. Uh, it's really yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, It's like shotgun shooting. Do, 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 do. And because, the yeah, it surprised us that the relative distance between the drone and the ground is, is, is enough that you can get away with a slower shutter speed than you thought. And yeah. relative, so, so we, we actually, and when you've got essentially maybe, you know, 14 minutes of shooting time by the time you actually get to your location, you've got to fly back. 
you don't have very long. So mm. if you're spending all this time settling the drone for every single shot and you're trying to do a stitch, you, you're going to half what you can what you can cover. I must admit, it takes a bit of romance away from it. Like, you know, like being in the plane, the chopper in one shot, and, you know, it, there is a beauty to that, whereas this does become very much like harvesting. It feels like you're mowing a lawn, like shot, shot, yeah. shot, shot. But, it's slightly less sexy at the time. Yes, yeah, that's right. Falls back, you're like... <laughs> Oh, I know I didn't have a face, but uh, this isn't too bad. I've got a photo somewhere. I don't think it's on here with with the difference between aerials, you know, with planes. There's Paul in the bush with one of my spare shirts over his head <laughs> next to a freeway, just looking down like that. And, um, you know, it's just it's a weird way to shoot, isn't it, Paul? Yeah, uh, yeah like you're not – I mean, you're often hiding somewhere because you don't want to um, – you don't necessarily want to make a fuss that you're out there doing stuff, depending on where you are. Um, so you and often you can't see the screen properly unless you're like under a bush or in the shade or, or with something over your head. So we're walking around with these like blankets over our heads. It's like zombies sort of out in these like 32 degree sort of wheat belts. Just, it was like the weirdest thing to look at. Farmers are driving past seeing two guys just staring at the ground with a top over their head in the bush <laughs> for, for half an hour. But, um, but yeah, we, we very quickly learned the strengths of the drone and one of them was that data harvesting going up and down. So we'd go out to somewhere and we were able to capture the whole uh, pond or whatever it was and then in post cut into it. And that was really unique to drones and really exciting for Paul and I coming from shooting predominantly out of hillies and planes. Hey, Scotty knows me well enough to know that I, I, I give things a, a bit of a bloody nudge and, uh, so I was like, all right, well, how long can these things stay in the air? <laughs> and the warnings start going off with 25%. And uh, I actually admit... It's actually good science and, and it was handy for Paul to know because when we first started, we were flying back with the five-minute warning. And when you're flying 10 minutes out to a location, you could really do with that five minutes. So what it meant at the end was um, that he came back with more good usable images because you have more time in the air. So it is a good idea to push the limits a little bit, make sure you're comfortable with it, and uh, and then Paul continued to push it for the rest of the trip. All I could all all the time here is the battery beep thing constantly. <laughs> so it's not actually healthy for the long term battery life of, of so I wouldn't recommend it. And there's sort of safety elements of all. So literally, I got back way earlier than that, but I actually said, Scotty, let's just try this out. And I got Scott to stand underneath it, ready to catch it and fell out of the sky. And we just waited to see how long it was going to stay in the air. And it was, I think, three minutes, 20 seconds or something. Yeah, it was three minutes. It drop, but actually let itself down. Yeah. And probably maybe six or seven flights, I was back on zero or below zero. Um, and, and and another thing that we very quickly learned was check the wind and the direction. And oh, check- yeah, of course. Yeah. So we were, we were going... You know, reasonably far, of course, line of sight, because that's what you've got to do. Um, we use binoculars. And um, we we realised, so we'd be like, oh, it's great, we're out there. But then you're coming back into a headwind, you're doing 20k an hour and you're on 10% battery. So you've got to be really conscious, we learned, of wind direction and then um, countering that in on your way back, eh, Paul? Yeah, so if you can organise it so you're coming back of the wind behind you, it's so much. you're so much more confident about it. And you can switch your mode for, say, in the Mavics, they have a program mode, which is kind of down the middle. But they have a sport mode, which sort of, it flies a bit quicker often. Um, it's, it, it removes some of the safety features in terms of the obstacle avoidance. So you've got to be aware of that. But if you're just trying to gun it, the other thing I learned is that gunning it back high, you're more likely to be dealing with wind than you if you're gunning it back low. So if you can get your drone down a little bit lower, you're more you're more likely to well you're less likely to be encountering as much wind. But if you're not aware of what obstacles are in the way, um, and you're too low, you you know your drone's not going to make it home. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a dance. So you usually set like a minimum home distance. So depending on what you're shooting around and where it's landing. So people have the capacity. It has the capacity if the shit hits the fan and it got, it's got to get itself back. It's not going to come back at too low a height and, and come up with any obstacles. Scott, have you got any of your drone ones floating around? Um, yeah. you know, I mean, they're on Scotty's Instagram. So another option is maybe to to hook up your Instagram on on the, and have a look at it that way, Scotty. On um, that idea, I'll load it up. 
Here he uh, is. Okay, it works because uh, you'll get a, more of a sense of what Scotty could do with his files. Like Scotty's drone files from from Hut Lagoon. Oh my god, I was I was really upset when he went up there and and you know he'd had a few issues and had to let his camera go. I think and. But he went up there with his drone and I was like, oh, is he going to fly? No, I think you could have flown, but it was just like, you know, you don't always have thousands of dollars lying around. And No, that's right. <laughs> epic, epic conditions. Probably the best I've ever seen anybody shoot at Hut Lagoon. And he nailed it with his drone. Um, I don't know if that's sharing yet. Oh, it is. That middle top one just makes me want to cry, mate. Is that sharing now? <laughs> yep. Uh, one second. I can't see a thing again. <laughs> so I'm looking at nothing. Hey, uh, uh, Matthew, is it coming for you? Give us a thumbs up. Is that sharing? No. It's going bigger. It's it's going. It's working for me, Scotty. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, I might get out and come back. So just watch yeah, for me, Paul. Just give me a second. All right. No, no problem. Um, yeah, that was a bit of creative license on this one, Paul. Um, oh, I was, I was wondering about that. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 these two didn't exist, um, but that's that's my editing style. You know, I'll, if I've got a vision, I'll pursue it. I mean, some of my images are. As is. Well, uh, this is a really good segue into that, Scotty, because we haven't sort of covered that part of your repertoire, which I think makes you stand out from most photographers I know in the world, particularly in the aerial realm. That Scott's capacity to apply his vision and and go places and explore other sort of potential interpretations from from out of a single file is almost like no one I've ever seen. Yeah, I uh, I like. I mean, sometimes it's very authentic. You no, know, I kept that very authentic with the sheep. You know, some sometimes it calls for it. The moments there, um, but so have a look at your fantasy shot, Scotty. After this, and you'll get a sense of what Scotty can do with a file compared to my flat ones. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's from the same spot. Yeah, that that um. You we see how much richer and deeper and, and more textural depth it has and dimensionality and. And I just look at it and go, oh, yeah, I, I was standing next to you, but I sure as heck ain't got those. Yeah, I mean, but that, I mean, two different two different shooting styles, uh, two different editing styles that Paul and I have got. I, I do like to, I like to go on a bit of an adventure um, when I'm editing, sometimes down a dead end, sometimes not. I mean, this this particular image probably took me six months to crack. Yeah, um, oranges, those, those orange lakes are very hard to edit, weren't they, Paul? Yeah. And, You've got to try and keep the white salt not blown out. Um, you know, one, one of the great advantages of being part of the AIPP and printing a lot is, you know, it has taught me a lot about printing. And so when I'm editing, I'm always in the back of my head, you know, making sure that I'm keeping things within realms that are going to be printable. And these salt lakes are, are in particular quite difficult because you've got to keep those really white salt patches um, not blown out um, and then try and work around it. So I do a lot of masking and and things like that so that I don't have to worry about the salt. So I might mask the salt away. So on this one, these patches, I just created a mask for the for the white salt patches. And then I would do my editing just on the orange. So anything I applied would apply to the orange, but not the salt. Um, so I could deal with it separately. Um, whereas if you're doing a global um, you know, edit, it's going to affect what, it, what affects the orange areas very well, might kill this, the white salt areas. Um, and that was a very simple mask. That wasn't, oh, I say that probably, I mean, but with Photoshop now and some of the, um, some of the add-ons, Aaron Dowling does a panel um, where, where it'll mask the light areas of dark areas pretty much from a click of the button. Whereas when masking first sort of came along, you had to make all the masks itself, didn't you? And um, so, yeah, you can, you can get panels. Aaron does a, Aaron Dowling does a panel. I think it's called ADP, I think. And, um, and it's a click of a button. So if you were editing something like that, you click the lights, have the highlight, and then leave that out. Um, that's sort of how I, I tackled that. But, um, yeah, I love the process of editing. I just I, I feel, for me, it's like sitting down at a canvas and painting. Um, so I, I'll spend um, many hours working on something, and I always find an image has a key. You know, I'll try 10 dead ends before I find the right direction. And with aerial photography, it's so much fun. Um, because there's so many abstract shapes. Uh, I've been experimenting with pink lately. I, I've gone in a pink mode. I'm not sure why, Paul, but I just, <laughs> um, but yeah, just these. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I'm. I don't think I just I see myself giving up aerial photography. Um, that's one I did in New Zealand a couple of years back. But I see a pixie with a with a little eye and a and a head and um, yeah. So that's sort of my process. I. I Paul's, you know, we, we, when we edit together, Paul stays in Lightroom quite a bit. Um, 
I, I use Capture One. I've moved completely away from Lightroom now um, just because it's hard to maintain two file catalogs, if that makes sense. So I, I and I use Capture One because I, I like how it treats color. Um, it, the way that you can add a color and capture, and I learned this from Christian Fletch, he started using it years ago, and it's true. It's just, it just handles color in a really beautiful way. And then I export from Capture to Photoshop. So Scott, I remember you saying that you were quite clear that the file structure in the drones in particular was far more beautifully handled in Capture One than what Lightroom was capable of doing. Yeah, and I also found with my Fuji files, so I, I, I had a Fuji 50S and a Fuji 100 GFX, and, um, and what would happen is Lightroom would apply a lot of pre-sharpening and things to the file that would kill it, and it was the same with the drone. Um, now, they're meant to load up RAWs, but they'll always do some pre-work um, you know, work to it, and you can turn it off. Um, but I, I Capture One just dealt with the drone files so much better for me. Um, that's my experience. Other people may prefer Lightroom, but um, you just get a nice buttery look with them, Paul, with Capture One, whereas I found Lightroom just sledgehammered them a little bit too much. So that looks like in that central kind of middle one, that's one of the wheat belt shots from our trip, was it? Yes, that is. Yeah, yeah. Can you, you notice the 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 depth and and impact of color that that Scott can find in the files? That I just still even trying my best in something global like Lightroom, I just can't get anywhere near it. With this one, I I the the the, the wheat fields were very yellow, and um, but I wanted this central sort of greeny yellow orange area to be the focus, so I killed a lot of the saturation um, around the wheat field. It pretty much killed any saturation around it and let these in the middle stand out. And that was just another masking technique. Um, you know, I, I made these separate areas, mask them off, and then I could deal with the wheat, desaturate it, get it the way I wanted, a little bit of contrast in there, but heavily desatted. And then, and then I could work on the color in the ponds to complement that separately. Um, so, you know, once again, relatively simple, but really powerful being able to sort of give a 3D pop um, and deal with things separately. I don't know. I still don't know how you managed to turn your dunes into liquid gold. Like if you go uh, just uh, below that and pick one out, for example, it's um, yeah, um, it's something I also feel like Scott does as good as anyone I've ever seen in the world. That's one I did recently, um, and so what I did there is the same thing. I created a mask that was just for the lips and the, and the dunes that are sticking out of the ground. And so essentially I have a mask for the flat spots and I have a mask for the jeans. And then I start working on the file separately because I'm trying to get it to pop out. Um, and that's essentially why I did that. I do a lot of um, lab color, color editing. So in Photoshop, I move to the lab color space um, and I'll, I'll use that for color balance predominantly. I find that's what I'll do to get the balance of color I want. Sometimes I'll use it to shift color or add color where it wasn't. But normally I find in lab color mode is the most powerful way of getting that beautiful color balance I want in the images, um, which is a little bit of a technical way to do it. I've, I've been working on it for years. I've sort of got my way to do it, but you use, you basically just go into lab and uh, use a, a curves layer and, and lab breaks the color channels into lightness, uh, A and B. Whereas in RGB, you've got, um, you, you contrast layer, you've got red, blue, and green. So it's a different way of dealing with color, um, but it's really, really cool for, for color balancing. Um, I don't know if I've got, does my screen change if I go to Photoshop? Can you see that now or is it still on the other screen? Paulie? So I'm just in my light, we're trying to get some photos ready to show. So uh, you're still on Instagram at the moment? Okay, no, all good, no, I'll leave. Um, but yeah, no, I, I love lab. lab. Lab's one of the techniques I use to do what I think you're asking me, Paul, is how do I get that color? Um, I, I pretty much all my color balancing is done in lab. I don't really do it in raw. I'll do it to general, but I'll do those fine tunes in lab in Photoshop. Um, because yeah, aerials are interesting because I, I, you, you're looking down on a 2D platform, but I, I'm always trying to get a 3D look to it and um and that's one of the challenges for me is to get that three-dimensional pop 
And um, one of the simple ways to do it is, yeah, it is that masking technique, leaving something sharp, something soft, something saturated, something's not, and you're building that on top and on top, and, and it's all just gentle nibbles to create that 3D look. So do you want to scroll down and maybe pick an image where there's a more conceptual element to what you sort of introduced that, and maybe talk a little bit about, I mean, you can see again, actually maybe pick out some of these drone ones and again, have you seen mine? And so like those three side by side, again, you'll get this incredible sense of depth and almost like multi-layered kind of, 3d element to to what compared to mine which are really quite simple and and just soft and there's a nice painterly quality maybe but scotty has the capacity to pull so much more out of the files and and nudge them in different directions and and give you a lot more to grip on so i guess in the image and and you can explore the depth of what that file is capable of doing to another level and it's a good example it's partly why i showed you mine first so you can see maybe in these three in a row what Scotty's done with this, with the same place, you know, you've, you've got that sense of depth and, and the oranges and, and that kind of pop that comes through and, and that kind of weightiness about them that whereas mine are a lot more sort of a bit flatter and flush. And that one on the right in particular is an example of, um, you know, tell us what you've done there, Scotty, in terms of pulling uh, those wild colors out. That's about 28 images stitched together. So to get this, it's quite a big, it's quite a big lake. So we had to do the lawnmower, so, you know, it's probably six images sort of up and, and across type thing. Um, stitched all that together. So I just loaded uh, the raws into capture, um, did some general adjustments, applied it to the rest of the raw files. So they're all the same, exposure the same, everything's the same. Loaded that into Photoshop, um, went to automated automation, add all files, stitch them together, bang, away you go. You'll get a, you'll get a, you, and Photoshop even lets you do content aware around the edges now, it's pretty cool. Then I've got my file stitched together and then I started working on it. Um, and I thought the, the center looked like, um, like an oyster shell, the inside of an oyster shell. So once I see a concept, that's where I head. So I wanted those pinks and purples to, to clash off the, um, the dirty dust around the outside. And, um, and quite often for me, it's just little nibbles upon layers and, 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 and making sure I'm editing, not global edits, but I'm editing what I want to edit at the time and nibbling and peeling layer upon layer upon layer, I find, you know, is what gets me the result that I want, which is that 3E look. Um, I'll show you something else interesting. So this is my first shot, Paul, at editing this Fanta Lake that we found. Sometimes it's really difficult editing. I find orange is really difficult and pink. Hut Lagoon, pink lake. You've, we've talked about this before, Paul. There's certain colours that once you pump contrast into them, you lose them. So this is my first edit. Then I came back um, probably six months later and I created that. And um, you can see there's a bit of a difference. You know, I've sort of got a bit of confidence with the files. I know where to push them. And now I'm starting to get that 3D depth that I wanted. Um, whereas back in the beginning, I, I still didn't have the files down pat. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's knowing with my editing style what the files can handle and not. And sometimes that will take you months of playing around. Um, and I, and some, you know, some senses are good with other colours and, and not good with, with certain colours, reds and blues. So it's all part and parcel, isn't it, Paul? Yeah, and uh, there's... there's uh... There's a few shenanigans that happen around uh, some of these things as well. I'm going to go into. I, I was just looking in the background at some of my um, photos and some of our some one of those Cal, Cal Barry stories <laughs> came up, Scotty. What's that one? Well, uh, or you jump off and I'll jump on and I'll I'll just uh, gonna, we'll have a slight segue. Yeah. Um, just for just for kicks and giggles. And you try to kill yourself by riding waves. Yeah. <laughs> so. So we'd, we'd finished the shoot at Calberry, and this is actually um, a body of work uh, based in Calberry. You can see around here. Um, I'll just try and get that to disappear. There you go. So Calberry has, has Hut Lagoon, which is basically an algae. It's, it's an algae farm, isn't it, Scotty? It is, yeah. Um, and all sorts of stuff, fish food, um, chemicals that go into concrete. BASF is based out of there. Um, they harvest all sorts out of there. So there's this kind of really organic component 
uh, which you can see almost like the spillover of the man-made kind of algae process into the natural world, which you can see really merging here. And then there's this really graphical sort of structure of, of the actual ponds themselves, which every time I go to, I think they're a little bit stronger in the summer, Scotty, when it's been a bit drier. Is that kind the, of the algae reacts to the sunlight. So the sunnier it is, the pinker the lake is, basically. So you really want it on a beaming hot sunny day and you're gonna get you're gonna get those colours stand out even more. Yeah, a little spill. It's it's very painfully and subdued sometimes, that, that separation. Other times it just about blows your eyeballs out. Um, this one I call blood and bones. It's a bit like um, blood flowing through capillaries and, and you'll see these little almost like knuckle bones that are running through on the edges and or like a vertebrae like sort of structure there. And, you know, it's very visceral and very kind of like blood-like in a way. And um, what, how long would you say it is? Probably about five, six K long? Yeah, it wouldn't be more than that, but it's, it'd be right up there, I think. Two, two and a half K wide, five or six K long. So just for if you're thinking of, you know, taking your drone over, but it's pretty big, you know, it's it's not a small lake. And some of the, the transitions in colour are so simple, but it's such a wonderfully graphic place. And this is another thing that, that I'll probably segue into after this, Scotty, when I tell a story is, is the fascination that you and I have had towards man-made structures and and mining structures and and processes that are actually fairly destructive. And we've, we've been just intuitively drawn to them as artists because of their, their, their powerful kind of physical structures and, and their, you know, hugely diverse color palettes and, and their very kind of original looking sort of structures and form. And that was one of the first things I think I reached out to Scotty is, is I've noticed you shooting some of these things and also Sheldon Petit as well. And I mean, how do you feel? I, I'm so mixed when I come back because I'm so used to just honoring the natural world that I have an incredibly mixed feelings about, about, you know, making artwork out of phenomenally destructive processes. Um, I'll stick right there in a second, but while, while we're here, like, so we finished the shoot there and we're a bit exhausted and, and Scotty sort of drives over the hill and all of a sudden I see this place and I'm like, Oh, this is, it was absolutely some of the best surf I'd seen. This is actually the next day when it was smaller and, and, and not as good. And being a, being a surfer and Scotty maybe sort of getting a sense of what being a surfer means. If you see like waves you've never seen as good as any of the world in front of you, like you start, you start shaking. You're just thinking, I'm going to sell my left testicle to get out here and, and surf this wave. And to go somewhere you've never surfed before. And this place called Jake's Point is actually a world famous wave being a heavy, quite a dangerous, but very powerful and beautiful wave. And, and I was just like, I was like, Scotty, I've got to get out there. How am I going to do it? And I was just like, and I was just looking around, who's here, who's here? And there's some little kid over there. And I just like ran up to him and just like, dude, dude, have you got any surf? Can I borrow it? I'll give you anything. <laughs> it was like, it was just like, well, who the hell are you, man? Like, I'm, I live here. Like, what the hell? I don't know. What, what else do you remember from the story, Scotty? Well, they were about 14 years old. And when, <laughs> when Paul decides he wants to do something, he's like, I've got to surf that. And I'm like, how? Hey, you don't have a bodyboard. You don't have any, like, what do you, you, it's not happening. He looks to his right and there's two kids on the beach with bodyboards. And I'm like, no, nah, no. Nah. And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, give me a sec. He disappears for like 10 minutes, comes back and goes, right, I've traded them a print, which he had up in the car. And they're going to land me their bodyboards and wetsuit. The wetsuit's up at the camp. So I've got to go. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he did. He goes to the car, gave these kids a print. He goes, fuck it, no. I, I'd only just met Paul. I didn't know he bodyboarded, right? I didn't. He was Paul was actually a champ back in the in the day. So I'm thinking this guy's nuts. He's going to kill himself. It's like six foot swell at six. It was, it was so, dangerous. It was, it was it was, well, I'm going to capture this. So at least I've got images of his death. And um, uh, <laughs> he goes out and he catches the first wave. He does his three. Before I got out, I shredded my knees half off on yeah. some freaking yeah. urchin infested reef that sucked dry on me when I was trying to paddle out. But you actually, you actually nailed it, and yeah, it was it was pretty amazing. But I don't know anyone else who can manage to rustle up a bodyboard in a wetsuit within twenty minutes. Well, I literally, I think I had forty five minutes of light. Like that's all I had. I had no idea where to paddle out, what the spray was like, where the rips went, what the currents did, how shallow the reefs were, and I was just like, oh, but it was firing, and I managed to get about four or five absolutely smoking waves. And the last one, I got a triple barrel on, which if you're a surfer, that's as rare as hen's teeth, and I got smashed on the end and. It got so dark that uh, the guys were coming down the beach with torches trying to find me. <laughs> yeah, because 
because th there's a lot of surfers there, right? So bodyboarders, surfers have this thing. So they're watching Paul go out going, yeah, he's going to die. And uh, after he'd done his session, there was much respect. But, yeah, they, they thought they thought he'd been lost. Um, yeah, and, and because the whole coastline is just reef, I was like, oh, where the hell do I go in? There's no beach. There's no nothing to land on. There's just these huge welders pulverizing into these chunks of reef. And so I ended up paddling like about half a kilometer down the coast trying to find somewhere to get out without smashing myself to bits. And it was way after dark by the time I got out. And I can't remember if it was you or one of the kids that actually found me with this torch. Um, was one of the kids, they, they were about to send a search party. <laughs> That's not that's not the first time we've had to send a search party for you, Paul. Oh, yeah, that's true, actually. And so he was so cool, this kid. He actually loaned me his gear overnight. He was like, mate, you're a freaking legend, and uh, I can miss out on a few ways. And we came back again first thing the next morning when it was much smaller, uh, like this day, and got a few more ways. But I couldn't find the original one, Scotty. You've probably got them somewhere. I mean, I've, got the whole, I've got the whole session. I'll have to send them to you one day. Oh, So, slight sidetrack, but that was kind of fun. So... What I want to move into now is this incredible project that Scotty and I put together based on what we we're talking about before. So this incredible fascination for, you know, man-made structures and mining structures and, and things that are quite destructive. How do we, I felt very strongly there was something really in this and I reached out to Scott and I reached out to Sheldon Petit and I said, let's do something with this. And we came up with a concept called altered lands. Like we wanted to represent how we're altering the earth by using it as a resource. And what I think is quite powerful about that as a concept is Australia's economy is built on these processes. And people know that, I think, factually, but they don't, I think, understand what that means in a literal and visceral sense to the actual earth. Mm -hmm. And so most of these places and these resource uh, mining processes are, are very remote areas. You, you never get any permission to go in there, let alone photograph it. And so it's kind of out of the collective consciousness of what it actually, the impact kind of means because we can't see it. Uh, but you go to the air, all of a sudden it's just unveiled. And so over the years, Scott and, and myself and, and, and Sheldon had, had covered all sorts of different places that were really remote and hard to get to and possibly some that have hardly ever been photographed before. And collectively we started building a really powerful body of work, which I then presented to the head on festival as a concept and they jumped at it and they made us one of their feature exhibitions mm -hmm. so out of the 200 exhibitions they picked i think 15 to 20 and they're like right you're it we've we've got you covered we're going to print it we're going to pick the location we're going to help you create it we're going to support the whole thing we're going to advertise it and it's just like booyah and they got us in oh, what was the building called it was right in circular key opera house uh, i can't remember the name of it but... house, i think it was yeah. And they were in these incredible light boxes. Um, and so they printed it on, on printed them on this like translucent materials. Really uh, cool. on these light boxes that just glowed back at you. And they print we printed them like you know about a meter in length. So you can see them from like five hundred meters away. And this was actually on during Vivid. So there's a hundred thousand people a day walking past these. And originally it was only up for six weeks and it ended up being up for six months. So the people there were estimating that it might've been close to 75,000 people that got through this over that half a year period. It's probably got more foot traffic than anywhere in the country. So it was just, it was kind of a bit of a fluke in a way. It was, but, it was um, an opportunity. I mean, this one, this one is Cal Barry on the left here. It's one of Scotty's. I think these are both yours, Scotty, aren't they? Uh, I think so, yeah. Is this a Shark Bay one? This one with the salt? Shark Bay and then, uh, and then yeah, part of the go. But, um, yeah, I remember one of the first, when we were out in Kalgoorlie and, and where I, I hadn't been out to Kalgoorlie in March, and I remember driving along and saying to one of the boys, wow, look at that mountain over there uh, with the with the vehicle on it. You know, you got all out there and, and the guy next to me said, yeah, that's not a mountain. That's what they've taken. That's the mountain they've moved. Um, you know, and that's all the out of the hole and that's where that really hit like holy cow we're actually moving mountains um and and then that tied in with this altered land sort of thing is because of the aerial perspective you get to really show that off um as some of sheldon's work there which is yeah so so what was quite interesting about this and we, we spent a lot of time thinking about this do we want to sort of give it all away or do we want to give people a bit of room to make their own interpretation so we didn't say where they were we didn't say what they were of 
they're all quite abstract compositions. So we're kind of being suggestive, particularly in the early parts of the exhibition where people drawn to those really simple, bold colours and graphics, you know, almost the beauty side of it. But, but near the end of the exhibition, we had images more like this, where if you went and, and really dug in, you'd see a tiny little structure there and it's, it's an office or it's one of those massive kind of mining trucks where the wheels are five times taller than you are and, and you look at the scale of it and just go, oh, my Lord. And it takes time for people to get to that position where they understand what the images are about. And we actually got people that were a little bit upset. The writer be going, there's not enough information. We don't know what's going on. And I was like, that's kind of the point. Yeah. That yeah. we wanted people to go on their own journey with it and apply and pull some of themselves into the images and build their own conversations until but, I got somewhere that really moved them or, or, or struck a chord. I mean, here in WA, you know, majority of our economy, uh, economy is based off guys, you know, girls working up on the mines, you know, I mean, that's part of the success of the state and, and what puts food on the table for many, many people. So, you know, you, you really have to be careful at, about how you approach it. And I think we just wanted to make people aware of what was there, which from the air you can do. Um, very hard to see when you're driving along the ground, isn't it, Paul? Like, Scotty, how, how would you describe, we had a few conversations early on about how kind of disturbed we felt about what we were photographing and, and we didn't quite know what to do with it. Um, yeah. And yet yeah. we kept being drawn back to shooting it. It's like, well, what do we do with this, this discord we have in ourselves as, as expressive artists and, and yet as, as landscape photographers and conservationists, how do, how do we work with this? That's yeah. kind of the ethos around where this exhibition was born from. So yeah. I mean, what, how would you describe that that kind of challenge, Scotty, within yourself? Like, like an, an we, talk, we talked about a lot. Uh, it, well, it's a really hard challenge for me because, you know, my day job, I, I own a company here that, that yeah, is in the construction industry and predominantly is dependent off mining, really, um, and the resources boom. So, you know, I'm right in the middle of it. So... I, I, I had a lot of conflicts, uh, you know, because I have seen, and look, you know, I think some, some of it's responsible mining um, and some of it maybe not so much. Um, so it was really interesting having conversations with how we were going to tell this story. And, and I actually needed to do this to probably help tell the story for myself and how I felt. Uh, when it started to come together was where I started probably forming my, my overall opinion a bit more. Um, because I wasn't sure how I felt, you know, because, because a lot of my work does, um, you know, tie in with the resources boom here. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting part of the culture of WA, isn't it? Like it really is a huge part of, of um, oh, here's Mr. Uh, Mr. Phase One himself at the time. A uh, bit of a legend in his own right and a fantastic shooter as well. That was such a cool setup how they lit those, Paul, eh? We never, did we ever find out exactly what boxes they used? Oh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. Like, um, I mean, this is something Scotty and I discussed afterwards about creating our own light box exhibition through WA of, of some of the materials. And, and we, Scotty even got down to the point of designing some of the structures. We even explored whether we would have like table shaped ones that are literally, you can look down as you walk past even, uh, as opposed to like vertical ones like this. But, um, you know, they have an incredible impact um, and through the night in particular, they just glow out the door and just draw people in like, you know, like, uh, like fireflies. Um, <laughs> so it's an unusual paper type stock that they use. It's semi-translucent and they printed, I can't remember who with uh, in Sydney, uh, but it's, it's kind of more of a film stock sort of type finish with a, a very kind of simple, very um, clean, sheeny kind of finish to it. But it's uh, it was very crisp and and beautifully impactful and uh, you know like to we we sort of tried to cost out a little bit how much it would cost actually no, like we, uh, create some of our own and it was like uh, it was going to be a lot yeah no we yeah, we, yeah, we slid away from that idea once we costed it up that was a later idea I think that was uh, Adam Williams's brother's <laughs> brother's suit I think I borrowed for the night I so Scotty um I'm, I'd love to um go back and look at some of it. Can you get up any of your bigger files that we're looking at before or um, is it being a bit funny still? Yeah, it might be. Um, Have a crack without me looking or without screen sharing to see if you can get it to come up and then maybe if you flip straight from screen share, it might just be sitting there. Yep. 
that might be a way to get around it. I'll have a little look see, but um, see if I can bring some over. What do you want to look at, Paul? Should we look at Shark Bay or? Oh no, something different maybe. Like um, this is a this is kind of X with Lake McLeod. Probably the pots. You know the paint pots and that kind of stuff. Scotty and I have been talking about this for a long time. Scotty got there well before me. Um, it's not an easy place to get to, and it's very expensive and debatably worthwhile when you don't really know what you're going to get. But uh, but I'll, I'll I'll let you. Have you got one up, Scotty? What's that with with which kind of image there, Polly? Oh, I wasn't sure if you found one of yours from from the cloud, but um, I just no. want to make sure you've got your time in the sun, mate. Basically, we've got sort of hey, hey, 20, 30 minutes left, and uh, so I want to give you the floor to go wherever you want to go, if depending on what you've got ready. I'm going to find some. I'll throw something up, which is the tailing ponds, which we haven't touched, which is WA Base. Oh, yeah, that's a huge one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, which, what I'll do is. Stop there in mind. I'm a bit of a new zoomer, not a boomer, but a new zoomer. Um, there you go. That, perfect. Oh. oh, yeah. Bang on. Perfect. So that, that's the um, that's tailing ponds. And we have heaps of tailing ponds here in WA because we have. Uh, a lot of uh, requirements to separate those minerals and materials that they they mine out of the ground. And we've got a couple within 30 minute drive of Perth CBD. Um, one of them, this particular one, I think, is right next to Jandicott Airport where you take off in Perth. Um, and I, so I've been photographing them for years. Paul has as well. Every time he comes over, it's our little go-to. We'll go do a mission and then we'll come back and shoot. Tell him because it's changing all the time. Um, yeah, you know, it's never the same really from year to year. Um, but they're incredibly difficult to to edit, I find, um, because you get a lot of reds mixed in. And these have been a really interesting journey for me on how to separate colour and bring a lot of the individual colours out. And um, and this one, this particular image did pretty well last year uh, at the Athens. It got a gold. And um, I was really stoked because I worked really, really hard on the editing technique to get this Jackson Pollock sort of look and color separation. Um, and I love it. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, this is my kind of cup of tea, real abstract, really out there. Um, you know, it's, it's very hard when I was starting off, I like color, but you've got to really respect color. Otherwise it can, it can look really bad, you know? Um, so, I really enjoy trying to balance um, that, you know, sort of hyper color in here, but making it look good. That nice slash that you've got going down the screen. Um, once again, you know, there was a bit of masking done in this just so I could focus on separate areas. But, um, but yeah, the tailing ponds are all over WA. And if you do come here and you're doing aerial photography, you can, you know, they're, they're uh, pretty much from, Perth, 800 kilometres north, and from Perth, 500 kilometres south. You just go on Google Maps and you can pick them up. And we've hit quite a lot of them, haven't we, Paul? Yeah, uh, we have. And we, we did, did some of them with the drone this time on the way back as well, which was a bit different. Now, I will say this. So I like what the drones did with blues and and um, and some of, like, the greens. And I don't like what it did with reds. You know, like... The, the, the drone images that I got of tailing ponds, I much prefer the ones off my Nikon or, you know, um, the Phase or the, or the Pentax. I, for some reason, I can't crack the reds with, um, with the drone files. I'm, I'm not sure what it is, but it's, yeah, that's one thing I, I didn't like from them. Yeah, it's, um, it's something that is, I'm still scratching my head out a little bit, Scotty, on those files as well, because we shot that together. So I haven't tried going into Capture One with those files yet. That's my next plan. Yeah, definitely do it, yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I this was shot on a phase. And that's – so when you're dealing, like – and basically that sensor's on the Fuji 50S. It's on the Hasselblad XD1. Um, it's on the Pentax 645Z, which you can pick up an old Pentax 645Z for half the price of the Nikon 850 now. Um, but it's that 50 megapixel Sony sensor and it's bloody beautiful for color separation. Um, so, you know, if you're into aerial photography and you can get a hold of that sensor secondhand, it's a really beauty to use. And it's, and it's in just about every camera van that you can get over the last six, seven years. Um, you know, they, they've got a version of it, but it allows you to really 
pull that color around um, with the color depth of the files. And, um, and that's what that was shot on. And I think that's, I think that's what I'm, when I say when I go to deal with the tailing pond shots with the drone, I'm just not getting that same luxury. So I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm not giving up. I'm still going to try and find a way of cracking it. But uh, so I'm far. Not to crack it you, my friend. Yeah. So but, Scotty, we, we talked about a lot of those different systems, but do we, you know, is there, is there a quick summary of what, you would pick over what for what reason in terms of the different systems? Um, yeah, I mean, I would, oh, I for, for pretty much that 50 megapixel. Uh, I, I just recently had a Fuji uh, 100 megapixel camera, which I, I let go. I had it for a brief while. Um, but the, the that 50 megapixel Pentax 645Z, Fuji 50S, IQ 150, and in the Hasselblad XD1, I love. It's probably what 70% of my work has been shot off of the last six or seven years. And um, and it's just a beautiful sensor. So yeah, that would probably be my favorite of all time. Um, if I was to go back from there, the old Nikon D810, I've still got files that I'm that I'm editing from that and I loved it, you know. If, you, if you're talking about something that's bang for your buck, um, I've never been a Canon man like yourself. You could probably shed a bit of light on Canon, but um, but yeah, if for aerial photography, if I had to say you want to, I mean, if money's no option, then go get your go get your phase one hundred megapixel or one hundred and fifty megapixel or whatever it is now. If you've got a spare sixty thousand dollars laying around, um, but if you're looking to do it on a budget, you know, an old six four five Z, um, you know, and take that out there and you'll get and some. That, that fifty five mil is really affordable, but it's it was we use that a lot. That's yeah. one of their stock standard lenses, but it was pretty effective. Yeah. And the other thing I that I've, you know, what I liked about the Fuji cameras, the 50S, is as a landscape photographer, if you're in a studio, great. Camera sits on a tripod, perfect conditions, good humidity. But as a landscape photographer, you're out in the cold, you're the dust, you're the heat. And um, where yeah. I came into a lot of issues with the phase cameras, they were too delicate. I couldn't get them wet. I couldn't get too much wind blown into them. You know what I mean? So you had to be really delicate with essentially a $40,000 camera. And then, and then the Fujis came along and the Pentax 645Zs with, you know, this sensor, but with the durability, um, you take it out in the wet. It can get rained on. It can get dust. It's dust sealed. Um, so that's where I've lent towards now. So I, I, I got in the, the, not the poor man's race, but the, Probably from me being a Canon shooter, the 5DSR was, you know, you can pick up one now for like $2,000, dollars Yeah. And if you shoot at lower ISO with some good glass, those files are still pretty amazing. And I'd probably say 80% of the work that you've seen of mine through my career has been shot on that. Um, I, I never forget getting spoiled rotten with the face shoots that I've done. And even the Pentax ones too really stand above. I, I would put the file structure as... Phase here, Fuji maybe just behind because the Fuji files and those new ones are pretty freaking amazing. And then I would put maybe I haven't tried the Hasselblad like you have, Scotty. Uh, then I'd put maybe the Pentax, and then I'd probably move down to the five DSR in terms of the quality of the file structure itself. What we should mention, Paulie, just quickly though, is the couple of the cameras you listed, particularly the fifty S and the Pentax, are now two thousand dollars to and three thousand dollars second hand. For the bodies, um, you know, whereas essentially those cameras were 20, 25, 30 thousand dollar cameras five years ago. So the secondhand market's real cheap with them now. You know, they're they're atta- just as attainable as a D850 if you were going to go and buy that bottle. And then now, thank you very much, Canon. Woohoo! And I'm actually probably this week going to release my video um, review of the new Canon R5 actually, which is the 45 meg uh, Canon sort of flagship um i mean the flagship is a one series but What's it's the flagship mirrorless and super impressed so i went out for the very first time and i put a zoom lens back on on an aerial shoot last week and i haven't used a zoom lens for about six years because i've never been convinced that the quality of the files is the same as as the primes so scotty and i mainly shoot primes i normally shoot 35 85 and, yeah. and the swing between one or the other and i take the hit on the flexibility of the composition for the quality of the file that I'm getting through that incredible glass and the capacity to keep the ISO down low and the, and the shutter speed up high by being, you know, the 1.4 lens that lets so much light in. 
Um, but I took out and I did the entire shoot on the new sort of um, almost like kit lens for the R5, which is the RF24105. And I pushed it really hard because it has eight stops of image stabilization, which is higher than any camera system I know of in the world. Cool. And so I was like, all right, I got a, I got a cheap flight, a little uh, ultralight. So I wasn't putting as much money down. I thought I'm going to experiment. And I was shooting down to 180th of a second uh, from the air, like in the wind flow, not like inside where it was all still actually out there going. <laughs> and I was getting sharp shots. I couldn't believe it. Um, so I was just like, Oh, and you know, the file structure of that camera with a native lens to the RF series was, um, it was great. Like it wasn't as crisp as maybe my 85 one four, but as it's still really usable, it was still pretty sharp to the corners. And, and because of that image stabilization, I kept my aperture up a bit higher just to cover bases that if it wasn't a sharper lens, I'll, I'll put it closer to its sweet spot. Like if I was six, if, if eight even, and I'm really impressed, Scotty. Like um, it's, yeah. it's opened up quite a, quite oh, a broader yeah. capacity for me to use the system. Whereas a five DSR was quite narrow. I wouldn't. I would never want to shoot an aerial shot over over ISO 200 if I could help it. It's something and, I think you should mention about glass pour that you just touched on then, which is finding that aperture sweet spot. Because a lot of lenses, when you hit a certain aperture, will be soft around the edges. Um, and in some photography, maybe that's an effect you want. Maybe or you know with depth of field, but with aerial photography, you want to sharp every corner of that image because you're not sure where, what you're going to use or where you're going to cut into it. So finding the sweet spot on your glass is really important, isn't it? Um, yeah, and, and it, it's, sometimes it's obvious and then it's usually somewhere around the F8 area. You don't you'd normally go wrong if you're in the middle there. Uh, but then, you, then you're then trading light, aren't you? So you want yeah. a bit of glass that can do F5 or F4, don't you? Or F, yeah. Yeah. And so Scotty and I get away with a lot more because we often shoot straight down and we're shooting on a very flat focal plane. So I've, I've gotten away with images at like F2.2 that are sharp edge to edge yeah. by shooting exactly straight down. And, and if we you start shooting a bleak, you don't have that luxury. And we've been caught out, haven't we? You know, where you just tilt up slightly and you go back into post, you're like, ah, oh, damn, we weren't straight down. And then, you know, you've got some softness. So... Yeah, I mean, you're a master at, at, at sort of, you know, doing a bit of perspective perspective warping, is that the word? Yeah, I mean, that's probably, you're more flexible than me, so you stick out of the plane better and look straight down. <laughs> so I depend on Photoshop and you depend on your flexibility of your body. My big, long, long wiry arms. <laughs> <laughs> Scotty, where, where do you see sort of aerial photography heading? Where, what sort of inspires you into the future, like... Um, you know, well, I know you and I have had some big discussions about what we could potentially accomplish in India or somewhere in, in terms of more conceptual ideas about how photography can be used to explore the world and, and make statements. Yeah, I think now more than ever, that's really important. And, and the aerial perspective um, really does give you a unique way to tell those stories. And, and we've, we've talked about the stories we want to tell. Uh, yeah, a lot of it's to do with, um, well, we talked about, obviously, the effects of global warming. Um, you know, we see a lot of pictures of glaciers melting and stuff like that. But um, Paul and I have chatted a lot about going to, you know, potential source of what's causing that and how the aerial perspective could tell that story. Um, obviously, COVID is, is, um, is slowed things down for everyone. But, um, but yeah, I, I see for, for myself and Paul and me, you know, we've got a lot of projects that we've, we've got in the bank, don't we, Paul, that we want to do. But um, what's really exciting, I think, for both of us, I could talk for both of us here, is introducing the drones to our, you know, when they first came along, we were like, no, we're shooting out of planes. We'll never use drones, you know. And after this trip that we did earlier in the year, it's really exciting for us both now what we can use. These, oh, hey, Mim. Hello. Um, okay. but <laughs> what we can do with the drones as well and, and how we can capitalise on these trips, mixing the drones in with doing... Um, you know, doing the planes and the helis. Um, I'm looking forward to the next generation, you know, the, the Mavic 3s. Um, if we could just get a little bit more ISO capability out of them um, and, a, and a slightly bigger sensor, um, then we're there. I mean, we're, we're doing a lot of stitching work at the moment and it's something that I'm exploring more and more um, where you can get really large printable files. But um, I think we're there already with the current generation, but just we're always wanting a little bit more, aren't we? Just a... Just 30 megapixels. 
Yeah, we're, we're, we're a little bit fussy. Scott even more than me because he has the capacity to... I just want to be more lazy. See, more megapixels, less shots. So, yeah. you know. Well, it's going to be more effective with our time so we're not having to stitch. Yeah, that's hard. Right. Um, can't be too that, far dynamic, away. that dynamic range is, is, is a huge part. So, did I, someone ask a question? Nick? No, I wasn't sure. I was just saying, it can't be too far away before you get the high resolution. Um, no, it's, it's, it's that sensor. It's the sensor that they can fit on that little, you know, I mean, that's going to be the weight and the size that they can fit on it. But I mean, look what they're doing with phones. Like, I've seen some of the, you know, the iPhone 12, the latest one, like some of the technology that they're implementing to get around the sensor size is incredible. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think I think the other the other option is to go a bigger drone. Um, yeah. But, I mean, that's obviously the portability becomes an issue there, I suppose. But, yeah, uh, I mean, there's already big systems you can put on, on big drones, but uh, this is it's, what it's all about flexibility. We couldn't well, believe it. it might cost as much as a phase one by the time we set it up, Nick. Well, what was beautiful though, when we did this trip, I mean, 20 megapixel sensor drone that packs into a bundle like that, like a shoe. Yeah. I mean, it's just incredible how quickly it's got to that point. Um, you know, that's that's amazing, isn't it? Like we, we were just blown away by, um, you know, being purists like we were and then doing that trip. It definitely changed us after nine days, you know, and then we're like, kids we're excited like oh we could do this or we can you know, and that's the cool thing about what we do is just exploring experimenting and um and then coming up with different ways to do things and and getting different results it, it's definitely a tool in the toolkit and i i put my money where my mouth is and we've got my commercial license now so i can kind of operate Does that mean you can crash into people now yeah i can sort of you know insurance rates go through the roof and <laughs> and i can get way more trouble if something happens so that's about the gist of it really but <laughs> but uh, I've been losing, you know, I've been watching Lukey get all these incredible jobs and doing things with his skills and it'll take me a while to get up to his kind of yeah. level. But, you know, I've been flying for a year and a half now, um, in Indonesia and New Zealand and around Australia and Tassie. And I did 10 flights in 12 hours last week, actually, uh, up in Northwest Tasmania. We've got some beautiful work. So I'm sort of, I'm looking forward to sort of chowing down into those when I would give myself the time, but it's, um, yeah, so I think surprise, Scotty and I both that we we've taken it on board. It, it, it's it's not going to overshadow. I think our, our overriding passion for you know being in planes and and leaning out the window is, is so much more um, visceral than than listening to a little mosquito disappear into the distance while you're staring at your phone. It's the, it's talking mean, cheese experientially, but yeah, it has a role and it has a place. It, it we talked about this, I think when you're up in the plane and you're smelling and you're feeling it, it affects how you shoot and also how you edit because your memory linked to that. Whereas what we found with the drone photography, we didn't quite have that connection. I know, especially with Paul, with your, some of your images, when, we, when we're up in the plane, part of wanting to edit is that trigger of the memory. Oh, man, I remember being up there and it was that morning and it smelt like that. And um, Whereas when you're doing the drone photography, you shoot over your head in the bushland somewhere and so it is weird, isn't it? Like you've got a, a different connection to when you're up in the plane. Uh, it is so exciting. It's so beautiful seeing it yourself with your own eyes. So it's it's something that I don't think we'll both ever stop doing. But I, I'll tell you what, you know, it's better. The drone sure as hell helps the wallet, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, but, but, I, but it also, I would say the productivity is about 8% of what you can do on a flight. Yeah, like, we, like it's so we, much lower the volume of material you come back with. Yeah, we thought that we'd have more productivity in a way, and we quickly learned, didn't we, that that you, we we kind of didn't um, because we're limited by height, um, so we're having to scan up and down. Um, yeah, it actually turned out the other way, didn't it, Paul? And you might get, you know, Scotty's doing one of his big stitches. He might get one photograph from a drone flight, one single photograph. And that's it. Yeah, that, that he can use. So it's kind of like. You know, whereas, you know, I come back, I came back from a flight last Monday, no joke, four and a half thousand images, yeah. one flight. Right. Admittedly, I was doing a little bit of burst modes here and there, and that's probably higher than I normally do, but it's very regularly over 2000. Um, and I would say a large percent of, the, of those files are very usable and quite amazing. So, so the productivity scale versus the money you spend is, is quite skewed between one and the other. Uh, depending on how many drones you crash, of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, you, you're up. You're up front costs obviously for the drone, but um, but yeah, you the we the, what we found is we're using the car a lot, weren't we? So you know, it's like you shoot one spot, you jump in the car, you drive half an hour, and you know, and then you shoot again. Um, yeah, you've got to be within a kilometre of what you want to shoot, really, yeah. if you want time to shoot it. And one, you can't always get there. I mean, you can push it to three, but that's most of your drone time to get there and get back and a very limited amount of time to shoot. So it's kind of, the window is much smaller, but you can really slow down and now your composition, hmm. which you pretty much can't do in a fixed wing play. It's like, yeah. bang, one second, it's gone. Another amazing thing that we learned straight away is, you know, all those times we're trying to get the plane to bank and not stall and everyone die. With a drone, you just look down and you've got perfect 90 degree angle. Yeah, like there you go, bang. Yeah, there you we, go. Have, we actually you, ourselves you it where it just goes just straight down and it's ready to go. You don't even have to go. You can so, set it up in a, as a custom feature. Because with Paul and I, as soon as then that's easy, we're like, well, we don't want to do that anymore. So we then found ourselves starting to shoot back up again because it was like, well, that's simple now. So no, we're, we're, <laughs> we're weird like that. And then we haven't got into it really hugely. At least uh, I don't know if Scotty has, but the video capability of of these things is incredible um and so what i did a lot of the time is as if i was flying back and i was finishing a flight i was like well i might as well just put it on video mode anyway because it's flying over some quite interesting material i've already photographed it but uh, i've got no time to shoot anyone it's going to fly back so so i've collated a bit of material that might actually come together really beautifully and th there's there's no comparison in terms of how close and how impactful and how dynamic you can get to your subject matter on a drone than you can in a plane because you can just get so much closer and so much lower and so much kind of in the face of the structures of what you're trying to capture by video. And for a long time now, even the earlier drones have had quite a high capacity to create, you know, really quite beautiful um, caliber video material. Uh, so that's already been high for a long time. It's taken a long time for the stills capacity to come up to a point where people like Scotty and I are actually getting remotely interested. Yep. And yes, you're, you're right, Nick. We've been mainly looking at this under two kilo market and there has been the capacity for quite a while to invest in bigger drones, six rotors, eight rotors, and actually put some of the camera systems we use um, out of the planes on these even. But you're talking huge amounts of money and probably no one would ever insure you for a bar of it um, or it cost you your car to do it. So, so it's kind of like we've kind of been waiting for that kind of... Uh, yeah potential and capacity to come into the smaller systems, which are very portable and much more affordable and, and more easy to ensure. So that's kind of the trade-off. Um, and I think, I think we're just about there. I mean, you've, you've, you've got some usable material, single images from it. I have as well. Like we're starting to use that material now, print it and, and things like that and having a bit of faith in that you know, for this generation. And um, yeah, but I still want to go do some flights soon, Paul. And not with a drone. <laughs> well, it's close, it's close. The WI was sort of like, well, yeah. we're thinking about it. We're thinking about it. And I was like, oh. Yeah. Although, although, you know, it's about time you came to visit me, my friend. I've done about three visits on your end. That's true. I, I, I should probably. Then I'd be like, well. Millie, Millie's nodding in the background. She's going, yeah, yeah Dad, that's right. Don't go. Don't go. He wants to get his Uncle Paulie Pats. I know you do. And those swims. We love those swims, Millie. But, um, no, nah, no, nah, it's... um. I think I think you and me can both say that drone photography after that mission uh, early this year has definitely got its capabilities, doesn't it? And it's definitely yeah, we did, what do we do? Three three thousand kilometers in seven days or something? Yep. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Welcome to WA, everyone. <laughs> yeah. That's six times around Tasmania, I think. <laughs> Radio right, yeah, Paul, I think we've passed our time. What do you reckon, Mark? Yeah, 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 Scotty, it's um. Thanks for inviting me, my friend. I, I kind of wanted to. I, I'm a bit. I always get greedy to to look up close to some of your work, and I feel like I didn't quite get to delve into as much as I like for people. But um, where where else can people really connect with your work, Scott? Um, at the moment, my website's down because I'm I'm moving the hosting onto another platform, so don't go there. Um, but my Instagram, um, basically, which is Scott John Photography, John with J O N without H, um, and that's probably the best place to keep up to date and find out what I'm doing. And um, it's a superb body of work on there. Like it's 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 one of the best aerial bodies of work in the world, I reckon. What Scotty has on us, and not only that, you'll get a sense of maybe some of the breadth of of Scott's work as well in terms of his his actually incredible astro work and dune work and and other sort of more 
more um, traditional landscape photography as well. It's just you know we we just we just love getting up there. <laughs> we, one, step, one step closer to heaven, I call it, Scotty. Yeah, that's it. And and I mean, you know, you're pretty lucky to meet. You know, on these adventures, sometimes it's quite hard. You're away for quite a long time. Um, you know, and it's good to find someone like Paul. You know, where you work well together, and you also complement each other's styles. And um, and I mean, there's been situations where Paul's pushed me. You know, I'm like, now nah, it's time to pack up and have a beer. I'm done. <laughs> and, you know, I've always got Paul there to go, come on, we'll go out, you know, for another couple of hours. And there have been the situations where I have, um, I've sometimes got my best work, you know. So um, I think it's really good finding a, a shooting buddy, um, you know, with, with that. So, yeah, I've been very blessed to go on these shoots with you, Paulie. And, and what I've learned about, you know, post-production and file structures and some of the more technical aspects of photography, which I hardly ever engage with from scotty I, I can't even i could write half a book about and even now i sit there just going oh if i only do this like scotty and i'm just like sit there going what does he do how does he do it even like six years later i'm still doing that so um i don't know i just press buttons and i hope it works <laughs> <laughs> rabbit holes my friend rabbit he goes down rabbit holes and then comes back out again he calls it uh, yeah. really thanks for coming on the show she she came on to give us a, a proper send off yeah, she's if a, you haven't seen Scotty's Facebook page, uh, Millie's quite a rock star on there, and for good reason. Yeah, yeah, that's it. She's she's saying, "Give me dinner now." Like she's like, "Hurry up and feed me." <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, speaking of which, uh, I I only got halfway through mine when the show started, so mine's waiting for me. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate you inviting me on, and um, I hope we've shared a bit of interest and information. Our pleasure, mate. Thank you very much for coming along. It's been terrific. Yeah, right, we you, uh, Nick. appreciate it. Yeah, we might uh, leave that one there. And then, uh, Paul, what do you reckon? Yeah, that's it. that's it for now. We'll uh, we're going to wait for Lukey to get back on the next day or two, and he's put his hand up for the next show uh, and organising that. So it's a bit of a mystery one at the moment. Yep. Um, but uh, we've got one coming up a little bit later with uh, Mika Boynton and Tanya Malkin, who um, who are sisters sisters from a, from uh, different mothers, I think. Uh, and they are also incredible aerial photographers, but but we're going to do a Kimberley focused episode on them because they they spent more than a decade each up there, and they know it just like the back of their hand. And from a very deep personal and almost sort of spiritual sense as well. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Awesome. So thanks awesome. everyone. Have a great week. Uh, thanks for putting up our bump in the road last week, but uh, we were going to have a break on one of the weeks anyway. So so we bumped it out to this week, so that worked out well. Scotty, love you, bro. Millie, big patch, Michael Paulie, miss you. Much. Cheers. Anyway, and we'll cheers. Uh, see you next